Hello and welcome to ASP.NET Core Identity with Angular JWT email confirmation. My name is Shayan Wage and I will be your instructor for this course. In this course, we are going to build a complete real world application from scratch. We will be using ASP.NET Core Identity using .NET 7 Web API as a server side and Angular 15 as the client side. And then we are learning about JWT authentication and authorization with roles and policy. We are learning about ASP.NET user manager, role manager, and sign-in manager. And we are making use of Entity Framework Core to create our database and apply migration and finally see the database. We are going to do a full implementation of user registration, login, email confirmation, forgot username or password, and reset password. Then we are going to learn how to sign up and sign in using third-party applications such as Google and Facebook account. We are going to develop our client application using Angular components and we are going to learn about form, validation, interceptor, npm package installation, angular service, and ngx bootstrap. Then we will be using angular off guard and role-based restriction in order to prevent any unauthorized user to access to some certain point of the angular part. And then we are going to implement admin panel to create and edit members, lock and unlock members. And finally, we will be deploying and publishing the end product of our application to Azure. And our application will be live and accessible to the internet. Let's talk about technologies and applications we are going to use in this course. In this course, in terms of technology, we are using .NET 7 Web API and Angular 15. And in terms of applications, we are using from Visual Studio the community version and Visual Studio Code. SQL Server and Microsoft SQL Server Management. And we are making use of Postman in order to test our APIs. And finally, we are making use of Azure Portal in order to deploy our application. Let's have a demo of our end result of the application. So this is the application that we are going to create in this course. First of all, if I try to log in, then we can see form validation here. And we have to populate the form in order to be able to log in. So I populate my form. And if I put invalid password, then I can see invalid username or password. So I make the correction for my password and I try to log in. And I have been logged in as a player and the player can see play button over here. And once they click here, they can see only authorized user can view players. And if I log out, then this time I'm going to log in as an admin. So I try to log in. And when I click on login, then I have been logged in as an admin. And as an admin, we can see an extra button over here. So if I click admin, then the admin is capable of managing all the members. And the admin can create a new member or edit an existing member. So for example, if I click on edit for the player at example.com, then I can see update a member and I can assign different roles to this player. So I can make this player as a manager and change the first name to Tom. And if I hit update, then I can see player at example has been updated. And over here, I can see the roles for player at example.com is player, comma, manager. And the admin also can lock a user. So for example, if I lock player, then I can see player at example.com member has been locked. And then if I log out from admin and I try to log in as a player, Then I can see your account has been logged. You should wait until some certain time in order to be logged in. So the player account has been logged and he has to wait until this time in order to be able to log in. So if I try to log in back as an admin, then I can go to admin panel and unlock my player. 
So I can see player at example.com member has been unlocked. And if I log out and I try to log in with player, then I can now log in to my account. And if the player tries to access to the admin panel, so if I type the admin panel over here inside the URL, then I can see admin area, leave now. So we are using auth card for making restriction for user base roles. And I'm going to log out from my player. And then let's try to create an account. So if I hit create an account, then we are going to have form validation for our registration. And then I have to fill up all the information. Then if I hit create account, I can see your account has been created. Please confirm your email address. So whenever a user is trying to register, they have to confirm their email address. Otherwise, they cannot log in. So if I hit OK and I try to log in with the account that I created, then I can see, please confirm your email because this email has not been confirmed yet. And then if I check my inbox, then I can see identity app, confirm your email. So I have received an email. Hello, Adam Jackson. Please confirm your email address by clicking on the following link. So if I click on the following link, then I can see email confirmed. Your email address is confirmed. You can log in now. And if I click OK and log in, then I should be able to log in. So any user is trying to register to our application, they have to confirm their email address. And I can click log out. And if this user has forgotten his username or password, then they can click on login and there is a link over here, forgot username or password. So the user has to put their email address over here. And if I click on send, then I can see forgot username or password email sent. And if I check my inbox, so I have one more inbox and I can see forgot username or password. And if I open, I can see, hello, Adam Jackson, username is this. In order to reserve your passport, please click on the following link. So if I click on the following link, then I have the ability to change my password. And I'm going to change my password from here. And in addition to creating an account using our application, so if I create account, and this time I'm trying to sign up with Google using my own Gmail account. Then if I click on sign up with Google, now I need to log in with my own Gmail account. So now I use another account and I'm going to put my email address. And as soon as I have been authorized by Gmail, then I can see an access token over here. And this access token is coming from Google authorization. Now I can see creating an account using your Google. So I can complete the registration by putting first name and last name. Then I hit create account and I can see hi Peter. So if I log out and if I click on login again, and this time I'm going to sign in with the Google account that I have been registered with. So I click on sign in with Google and I choose the account that I have created, my account, then I can see, hi, Peter. So I have been successfully logged in to my application using my Gmail account. And if I click log out, and this time I'm going to make a use of Facebook. So if I click on Facebook, now I need to provide the email address for my Facebook account. So I have been logged in with my Facebook account. And if I try to log in, then I have been successfully authorized by Facebook and I can see the access token that has been returned back from the Facebook. And then I need to fill up the first name and last name in order to complete my registration. So I hit create account and then I can see hi Ben and I'm going to log out and then I try to log in with the Facebook account that I have created. So if I click on Facebook, then I can see hi Ben and this time I have been logging through my Facebook account. So I'm going to log out and I'm going to log in as an admin. And I'm going to display the admin portal. So I click on admin and I can see all the members available to my application and I can remove any members that I wish to do. So for example, I'm going to remove this account. If I hit delete, then I have to click on yes. 
And once I click yes, then I can see deleted member of crazy8546gmail.com has been deleted. And this application has been published to Azure portal. At the top, I can see identity app udemy.azurewebsite.net. Okay, we have done the application demo. Then let's talk about what are the prerequisites for taking this course. In order to take this course, you need to have at least one year of web application programming experience with ASP.NET API and Angular. And you need to have experience with Entity Framework as well. And you need to have some basic SQL Server knowledge. This course is not designed for an absolute beginner. But if you don't have one year of experience and you are still willing to take this course, then sure, go ahead and take this course as I am starting from scratch and explaining everything as detailed as possible. And let's talk about who is this course for. So this course is for individuals who are interested in leveraging their knowledge of .NET Core and Angular to develop an application that simulates a real world user registration and logging scenario. And this course is also for those who are seeking into learning deep knowledge about ASP.NET identity and use those in their own programming career or their own web application project. And this course is also for those who are interested in gaining knowledge from my own programming experience, which I acquired through years of industrial experience. I am super excited to be your instructor and teach you some practical knowledge. Thank you for checking out this course and I hope to see you in my course. You can download the course content from, from section one and from resources. So if you click on here and you can click on course contents, then you can download the course content available for this course. Let's start to develop our app by creating a project. So we open Visual Studio 2022. And then we click on create a new project. So from here, I'm going to choose Web API. I select this one. So make sure to select SVNet Core Web API. And then I hit Next. Then I choose my folder. And for the project, I name it as API. And for the solution, I name it as Identity App. Then I hit Next. And I choose .NET 7 standard term. And with all these settings, I hit create. Okay, my project has been created, so I can start my project here. And if I start, the swagger will pop up. So I, I, I click on advance and accept the risk and continue because it, it is HTTPS. Then if I hit get and try it out, then I can see the weather forecast is coming up. So I close this. So we're not going to use weather forecast, so I remove it right away. And from the controller, I'm gonna remove weather forecast controller as well. Then I double click on API in order to go to the CS project. So I'm not going to use any nullable enable or implicit using, so I make both of them to disable. and I save the file. And when I save this file, I'm gonna have some error. So if I open my program.cs, I need to bring the namespace. So I put my cursor on web application and then I hit control dot. And then it prompts me using Microsoft ASP.NET Builder. So I do that and then for the any other red messages, I'm gonna do the same. So I need to bring the proper namespace for those things as well. Since I have removed or disabled my implicit usings. Then after this, I open my properties and launch settings. So this is where we are going to see the URL of our application. I'm not going to use any HTTPS for development. So for the development, we are going to use only HTTP to make everything as simple as possible. So I grab this and I remove HTTPS. And for our application, we're not going to use Swagger. 
we're going to use postman to test our APIs. So I'm going to just make this false. And once I save my files, I can see my HTTPS has been changed to HTTP. And inside the dropdown, I have only the option of HTTP, IS Express, and WSL. So I don't see HTTPS in here anymore. And we're going to run our application using HTTP only. And I close all the tabs. And just from the beginning, I would like to push my application to GitHub in order to make our application save on a repository. So I navigate to my GitHub account. And from here, I click on new. I need to choose a repository name in here. So I name it as identity app, the same as the solution name. And I'm going to make it public. And then I create repository. So from here, I need to follow up these commands. So I open uh, my command prompt inside my projects. I navigate to my project. And from here, I click on here if you're using Windows. And then I type CMD. Before following these commands, I would like to create a .NET git ignore file. So in order to do that, I just type .NET new git ignore. And this will go ahead and create my git ignore file. So if I open my project from the folder, I can see git ignore has been created. And if I open this git ignore file, I can see all the folders or extensions that are going to be ignored in order to be pushed to the GitHub. Okay, let's push our project to GitHub. So I open my command prompt from the folder and then I type git init in order to initialize the repository. Then I type git add dot. So when I put git add dot, it's going to add all the files inside this directory or folder. And then I type git commit minus m api project created. Then I hit enter and then I type git branch minus m main. Then I'm going to copy this and I paste it in here. And then I copy the last command and I paste it in here. And you might sign in with your browser. So I can see authentication succeeded. And then if I navigate to my GitHub and I, if I refresh, I can see my project has been pushed to my Git repository. So I don't see it over here. So in order to see my GitHub is already in here, I can just close my Visual Studio and open it again. So if I close and I open my identity app solution once again, now I can see my project has been linked to the GitHub and I should see main over here as well. In order to begin, we need to install some packages. For this application, we're going to use ASP.NET Core Identity. I right click on API project and then I choose Manage NuGet Packages. And I click on Browse. From here, I'm going to install the first package that is Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server. So for our application, we're going to use SQL Server as a database. So I choose this one. So if you don't see it in here, just search for SQL Server. And from the menu, you can see Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server. I hit install. The next package is tools. So if I search for tools, and if I look for Microsoft Entity Framework Core Tools, I can see this package in here. So I hit install, and this package is going to be used for adding migration to our database. I click OK, and I accept. Next package is JWT Bearer. So we're going to use Microsoft ASP.NET Core Authentication.JWT bearer in order to authenticate the user. So I select this one and I install this package. 
and then I hit OK. The next package is JWT. So if I search for JWT, I can see system.identitymother.tokens.jwt. And I choose the latest version and I install. And the last package that we're going to install in here is Identity Entity Framework Core. So I type identity and I should look for Entity Framework Core. So from here I can find Microsoft.ASP.NET Core that identity that entity framework core. So I choose this one and I select the latest version and I install. And just one thing about this versioning, since I am using .NET 7 as my .NET version, so from here I can see that .NET 7 is my the version of the .NET that I'm using for this application. And this has to match exactly the first number of the package you're going to install. For example, if you're using .NET 6, then this should be selected from 6 version, not the 7 version. So I select this one and I install. So if I navigate to my csproj file, I can see the packages that I have installed. So just a quick comment about this. This package is going to let us to authenticate the user using JWT. And the next package is Identity Entity Framework Core. So this package is going to let us to derive our DB context from Identity DB context. And the next package is Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server. This package is going to let us to connect to our SQL Server and create or update table inside our SQL Server. And the next package that we have installed is Microsoft Entity Framework Core Tools. And this package is going to let us to add migrations to our SQL Server. And the last package that we have installed is tokens.jwt. This package is going to let us to create token and, uh, and validate the JSON web tokens. Here I reformat everything and then I hit save. After installing our packages, then we need to create our user model. So I'm going to create a new folder and I name it as models. And I have a user class. So I create a C sharp class and I name it as user. And my user class is deriving from identity user, which is from Microsoft ASP.NET identity. So I need to put my cursor and control dot in order to bring Microsoft ASP.NET Core identity. This class has been defined by Microsoft ASP.NET Core and it's going to have some properties inside. So if I navigate to that, if I right click and go to definition, I can see it has some properties such as ID, username, normalized username, email. So everything that has been configured by Microsoft. So our user is deriving from this class and I'm going to add more property into that. So I'm gonna do prop and I press tab tab and the first thing is first name. And the second property is last name. And the last property is date time, date created. And I'm going to assign it to date time that UTC now. And I'm going to make this property required. So I put required data annotation on top of first name and last name since they are both string. So whenever there is a string property, it can be null. But I, wa I want them to be not null, so I put the required data annotation. And since this is a date time, it is going to be required by default. After creating our model, then I'm going to create my context. So I create a new folder and I name it as data. Then inside data, I'm going to have a class and I name it as context. 
So my context is deriving from identity DB context. Why are this derived from identity DB context? Because this is a base class for the entity framework core database context used for identity. And since we're using Microsoft ASP.NET identity, so I need to derive from identity DB context rather than DB context. And for here, I'm going to provide the type and that the type is going to be the user. So basically it takes the user model and since I have a user class and which is deriving from identity user, I need to pass it over here. Then I'm going to have a constructor and inside my constructor I have db context op options. And I pass context and I name it as options. And I pass the option to the base. Then the next step is to configure our database inside our service. So I open my program.cs and below this line of code, I'm going to have builder.services.addDB context and I pass my context and then I'm going to have options. And inside options, I'm going to have use SQL Server since we are using SQL Server as our database. And then I'm going to pass the connection string. So the way we do is builder.configuration.get connection string. And I name it as default connection. And I put semicolon at the end. So we need to provide the default connection inside our app settings. So since we are in development mode, I'm going to choose app settings.development.json. I open this file. Then in here, I'm going to have another section called connection strings. So be careful of the naming. This has to match connection strings with Prula. Then put the query brace then I have default connection and in here I'm going to have server equals localhost so my default connection string is server as localhost and the database that we're going to use is identity app. So in here, I have trusted connection string equals true. Then I have multiple active result sets equals true and trust server certificate true. In order to get a server name, we need to open our SQL Server Management Studio. And whatever you're seeing in the inside server name, that's going to be your server name. So I need to copy this. And instead of localhost, I need to paste whatever that's from here. So you need to be able to connect with your server name. So if I press connect, I can see my I have been connected to my database. Then with this, I'm going to add my first migration. So I save everything and then package manager console. And inside here, I type add migration. And I name it as adding user to database. Then I'm going to target into new location. So I put dash O, then data and forward slash migrations. So I'm going to put my migrations folder inside my data folder. So I press enter. And I can see migration has been created inside data folder. And this is the table that is going to be built after we update our database. So we have ASP.NET users and these are the three properties that we have added extra to our ASP.NET users and the rest is all default Microsoft ASP.NET tables such as ASP.NET claims, ASP.NET logins, ASP.NET roles. So all these classes are coming from Microsoft ASP.NET core identity. And after this, I'm going to update my database. So I put update database. 
So this will go ahead and create our database for us. So if I open my SQL Server Management and if I refresh here, then I can see my identity app has been created. So I can see it has some default Microsoft Identity Core tables, such as ASP.NET Users, ASP.NET Roles. In this video, I would like to add my identity core services to my program.cs. So I open my program.cs and after my add db context, then I'm going to add builder.services.add identity core and then I pass the user class that I just created. So I'm going to bring the namespace and then I open parentheses and then options and inside options I'm going to configure the password requirements so for example we have options that password that required length 6 and then I have options that password that required digit false then I have options that password that required lowercase false and as well as I have options that password that require uppercase false and I have password that require non-alphanumeric false and I have options that sign in that require confirm email and this is going to be true then I put the semicolon in here so this is defining our service so this is for defining our identity core service And these are the requirement for password. So if I don't specify all these, then by default it's going to have some default password requirements, such as it requires a digit value, it requires a lowercase, it requires uppercase. So based on your application, you can configure your password configuration. But I'm going to make it as simple as possible. So I set everything to off except the required password length. We're going to accept minimum six characters for our password. And later in this course, and later in this course, we're going to have email confirmation. So that's why I have options that sign in require confirm to true. Then after here, I'm going to have add roles, and the class is identity role. And I need to bring identity role from Microsoft ASP.NET Core. Then I have add role manager. Then I have role manager identity role. Then I have add entity framework stores and this is going to be context. And then I'm going to have add sign in manager and I pass sign in manager. And this takes a type and the type is user. Then I have add user manager and user manager and then we have user as a type and the last thing is add default token providers so the first thing is allow us to add roles the second one is allow us to use to make a use of role manager in order to create roles and the third one is providing our context for identity core and the fourth one is to make a use of sign-in manager in order to sign the user in. And the fifth one is to let us to make a use of user manager in order to create users. And the last one is in order to create some tokens for email confirmation. Along adding our identity core as a service, I have added extra services in order to make a full use of Microsoft ASP.NET Core Identity. So I have add roles manager, I have sign in manager, and I have user manager. And then I'm going to make a use of some token creation for email confirmation. So it's time to create our JWT services. So I right click on API and I create a new folder. And I name it as services. Then inside here, I'm going to create a new class and I name it as JWT service. So 
So in this class, we're going to have public string create JWT. And this takes a argument, which is user. So I need to bring my api.models and I name it as user. And it returns a string, which is our JWT. But before that, we need to inject some configuration. So I create a constructor. And in here, I have I configuration, and I name it as config. Then I'm going to initialize my config. So I over here, I press control dot, and then I hit this one, create and assign field underscore config. If you could not find this option, so that's because you need to add that into your Visual Studio. So in order to do that, you need to click on tools and options, then from here, choose text editor, then choose C sharp, and choose code style, and then choose naming. Then in here, you need to click on manage naming styles, and then hit plus. Then in here, name it as private field, and then inside require prefix, just put underscore, and then use camera case, and hit OK. So since I already have that, this is what I'm going to have. So I have a private fields and underscore. And this is camera case. And hit OK. And then hit OK as well. And then you need to add a new specification. So you have to click on plus. And then from here, choose private or internal fields. And from here, Choose whatever you have named it or created just right now and then make it as suggestion. So since I have it already here, I'm going to delete this one and then once this is done, hit OK. And after you have followed those instructions, then if I put my cursor over here and I press Ctrl dot, then I can see create and assign field. So this is going to create a private read only and it puts underscore beside my private fields property. Then I'm going to have another private read-only field. So I type private read-only, and this is going to be symmetric security key. And I name it as JWT key. And my JWT key is going to be new symmetric security key encoding so I need to bring the system.txt.utf8.getbytes and then I put underscore config and I'm going to have JWT section and I take the key. So I'm going to take my key from my app settings.development.json. Okay, now we need to create our JWT key. So I open my browser and inside Google, I just type random key generator and the first link, I'm gonna open this. Then from here, I'm gonna select this one from 256 bit key generator. So any random key is sufficient. So I copy this one and I navigate back to my Visual Studio and I open my app setting.development.json. And then after here, I put comma and I type JWT, then colon, and I put curly brace, then key, colon, and I paste that random key that I copied. Then I have expires in days. So for development, I put 15 days, and then issuer, colon, and for the issuer, we need the URL for the API. So I open my launch settings.json and from HTTP, I copy this. This is the URL of our development API. And I head back to my app settings.development.json and I, and inside quotation, I paste the URL. So if I open my JWT service from here, I can see we are going to take the key from app settings.json. And since we are using development so it automatically takes from app setting dot development dot json but from production it's going to take from app settings dot json that's why we have specified our values inside app settings dot development json since we are doing our development for now
and then it's going to look for JWT section and from that section it's going to look for key section so from JWT section then inside JWT section it's going to look for key section and from the key section it's going to take this whatever the value is inside here so it's going to paste that value in here and get bytes is taking a string as an argument then it converts to byte array and this symmetric security key is taking byte array that's why we are using encoding.utf8.getBytes so basically this transfer my string of key into byte arrays and then symmetric security key is going to create a key for us and it's going to put it inside our underscore JWT key and with this JWT key we are going to both encrypt and decrypt the JSON web token and after here I'm going to have var user claims equals new list claim and then I'm going to assign some claims inside there. So I open and close curly brace. The first claim I'm going to have is new claim, claim types, dot name identifier, then user dot ID. So I'm going to copy this two more times. And the next one is going to be email. And this is user dot email. And the next one is going to be event name. So this is going to be first name and the last one is going to be surname and of course it's going to be the last name. I remove this extra line and then I put semicolon and then I'm going to have var credentials equals new sign in credentials and then I'm going to pass my key so it's going to take a key and the algorithm. So for my key is underscore JWT whatever we have populated over here and then I put comma and then we have security algorithm dot hmac sha 512 signature then we are going to have var token descriptor equals new security token descriptor then I open and close curly brace so for the subject we are going to have new claims identity and I pass my user claims that I have assigned here so I copy and paste over here then I put a comma expires is date time dot utc now dot add days and I'm going to have int dot parse and I pass my config and from config I'm going to have again JWT section and expires in days then I put comma then we have sign in credentials is credentials and we have issuer is again underscore config jwt and issuer and I put semicolon over here and after this we are going to have var token handler is new jwt security token handler then we have var jwt is token handler dot create token and we pass the token descriptor and finally we have return token handler dot write token and we pass the JWT now I would like to explain what I'm doing over here so at first I'm going to have a constructor and inside my constructor I'm going to have I configuration injected inside this class then inside my constructor I'm going to have a JWT key provided by whatever values we have put over here so we are going to have JWT key and this key is going to be used for both encrypting and decrypting the tokens then inside my create JWT method I'm going to receive an argument of type user then I'm going to have some claims inside my token so whenever we are creating a JWT token, we are going to have some claims inside that token. What kind of claims are we going to have inside that token? The first one is the user ID and we place it inside name identifier. The second one is email and the third is given name and the fourth is surname. And we simply can create a new claim like this. So if I put new claim and if I want to 
have my own name I'm going to have my own claim name and whatever value you would like to put this is the value so for demo I'm going to display this but I'm going to remove it later on and after this we are going to have the credential so this credential is new signing credential and this sign-in credential is coming from system.identitymother.tokens.jwt the package that we have installed and this sign-in credential is going to take a key and then the algorithm so based on what algorithm is going to generate our credentials so we pass the HMAC SHA 512 so this is the most secure algorithm so far to generate a credential and then after that we are going to have token descriptor so this is basically our description of our token so inside our token description we are going to have a subject and this is going to take claims identity and this claims identity is going to take user claims so this user claims is list of claim and we have assigned five claims inside our tokens so inside our subject we are going to have all these values then our token will be expired in some days. So we have a specified over here. So we said datetime.utcnow.addDays. And then we get the value from our app setting development.json. I have that value over here, expires in days. And this is going to be 15 days for development. Since that is a string, we need to parse it to integer. That's why I have used int.parse. So this will convert string into integer. Then we have a signing credential and our signing credential is whatever we have specified over here based on the JWT key and the algorithm. And then we have our issuer. So inside our token, we are going to have an issuer and, and the value for the issuer is going to be taken from app setting development JSON and from issuer section. And for the issuer section, we have just put the URL of our API application. That's why I have copied this, our API URL inside our issuer. And then inside our JWT service, I'm going to retrieve that from my app settings.development.json. But for the production, we are going to look for app settings.json rather than app settings.development.json. Then we are going to have a token handler and we are going to create our token based on the descriptor and we are going to return our token to whatever is going to call this method. So now we need to provide our JWT service class inside our program.cs in order to be able to do dependency injection for our JWT service. So I open my program.cs and after my builder.service.addDB context, I'm going to have builder.services.addScope then I pass my JWT service class and I close by semicolon. So by this line of code, we will be able to inject our JWT service inside our controllers. And I save everything. And finally, we need to implement the authentication service inside our program.cs. So after my builder.service add identity core, just after here, I'm going to have builder.services.add authentication. Then in here, I'm going to have JWT bearer defaults. And I need to bring from Microsoft ASP.NET Core authentication.jwt bearer, the package that we have installed earlier. Then I have authentication scheme. And after here, I'm going to have a dot add JWT bearer. And we are going to have options. And I open and close curly brace. And inside options, we are going to have token validation parameters is new token validation parameters. So I select this one. And then I open and close curly brace again. And then we have validate issuer signing key is true and then we have issuer signing key is new symmetric security key then we have encoding dot utf8 dot get bytes and then we are going to take our string value of keys inside our app setting that development that json once again by using builder dot configuration 
and then inside configuration I put bracket and JWT colon key and after here we are going to have valid issuer is builder dot configuration from JWT section and issuer then we have validate issuer is true then we have validate audience is false and I put semicolon at the end of these two so first of all we have added this line of code in order to authenticate our user by using JWT token in order to authenticate our user using JWT and we are going to authenticate the user using bearer so if I hover over here we have bearer inside here so we are using add authenticate what type using bearer then we have add JWT bearer and we have options and inside options we have options the token validation parameters is new token validation parameter and inside the token validation parameter we are going to have validate issuer signing key so we are going to tell that we need to validate our token using the JWT key that we have provided so this line of code is telling we are going to validate token based on the key and then we are going to tell where to find the key so issuer signing key is new symmetric so again we are going to generate that key based on whatever we have over inside our app settings at development.json so we are going to use builder.configuration and this builder.configuration is the same as whatever we have over here underscore config so if I navigate back to my program.cs we have builder.configuration and from the JWT section look for key section so inside our app setting the development JWT section look for key section and this is the key that we are going to use for both decrypting and in encrypting JWT so we pass that key and, and based on that key we are going to validate whether this JWT is valid or not and then we are going to tell validate our issuer over here and we are specifying the valid issuer is the URL of the server and we have specified the URL of the server inside over here JWT issuer and for the validate audience we set it to false so we're not going to validate any audience the audience is going to be our angular application So after this we are going to add the pipeline so in order to do that inside our configure the HTTP request pipeline and just before app.use authorization we are going to have app.use authentication so by adding this pipeline we will be able to authenticate the user and authentication should come before authorization So by the terms of authentication we verify the identity of a user and by the term of authorization we determine their access rights by using use authentication we are going to determine that whether they have logged in or not and by the term of authorization we are going to determine and what type of permission they're going to have to access to different routes and we are going to use that later in this course and then I save everything Okay, after we configure our authentication inside program.cs, then it's time to create our very first controller. So I right click on controller, and then inside here I select controller. Then from this menu, I choose API and API controller empty. And I hit add. Then for the controller name, I'm going to name it as account. So make sure this is account controller, and I hit add. The root of our controller is going to be the URL of the application forward slash API forward slash the controller name and in this case is account. So I'm going to inject some services. So in order to do that, I'm going to create a default constructor. Then the very first service we're going to inject is JWT service. 
the service that we have provided and I name it as JWT service and I'm going to initialize this so I control that and create an assign field underscore JWT service then I put comma and then the next service is going to be sign in manager and then I pass our user as a type and then I name it as sign in manager and I'm going to initialize this as well and the next service is user manager so I select user manager and I pass user and then I name it as user manager and I'm going to initialize this as well so I bring this into a new line our signing manager is responsible to sign the user in and the user manager is responsible for creating the user and they both are taking the type since we're using user and this is derived from identity user so we are passing that user class inside the type then I'm going to have a private helper method so I'm going to specify this region private helper method and then I end the region so this is basically like a comment it doesn't do any coding so it's just for readability for the developers and then inside here I have private user DTO and create application user DTO and we are going to receive a user class and from here we are going to return new user DTO we don't have the user DTO at the moment over my API project and then I create a new folder and I name it as DTOs what's a DTO? a DTO is data transfer object and this is a class that is going to be passed to the user or the client if you're coming from MVC background so this is like a view model the view model that we are going to pass to the client so inside my DTO I'm going to have another folder and I name it as account so this account folder inside DTOs is representing any DTOs that we are going to use inside our account controller. So inside my account folder, I'm going to have a class and I name it as user DTO. The same name that we have specified over here. So since we already have created that, so I can bring the namespace. So if I put my cursor over here and I press control dot then I can see using api.dtos.account and the error goes away so for my user DTO I'm going to have prop string first name prop string last name and prop string JWT I head back to my account controller inside here I'm going to have the first name is user that first name last name is user that last name and JWT is underscore JWT service that create token and I pass the user object there as well then above region I'm going to have my very first endpoint which is login so I use HTTP post since we're posting a model to this method and I name it as login and over here we have public async task action result and user DTO and I name it as login and we have login DTO and we have to create that model as well so I name it as model and, and I open and close the curly brace so inside my account folder I'm going to have login DTO as well so I'm going to hit add and class and I name it as login DTO the login DTO will have prop of string username and prop of string password and both of them are required so I put required attribute on top of both of them and then I head back to my account controller and this error has gone whenever the client is trying to hit this uh, endpoint they are passing a model and that model is based on login DTO and that model will contains a username and a password which is here then over here I have var user is await underscore user manager that find by name async then I pass my model that username so based on the username that the user is providing we are trying to retrieve the user object from our database 
and then if this user object is null, then we simply return unauthorized. So I say if user is null, then return unauthorized. And for the message, I say invalid username or password. And I put a semicolon. Then I'm going to check for the email confirmation. So I'm checking if user email confirm is false. Then I return unauthorized again. And I say, please confirm your email. And I put semicolon. Then I'm going to have a var result is await sign in manager dot check password sign in async. And this takes a user object and the password. So this is model password. And for the third argument, this is going to be lockout on failure. So we put it false for now. And then I put semicolon. Then I have if not result that succeeded. So if the user has failed to provide the proper password, then simply return unauthorized again. And we say invalid username or password. So we try not to be clear for the user whether they have input the wrong username or password. So that's why for both message, we have invalid username or password. And if the user has successfully input their username and password and their email confirmation is true, then we return create application user DTO and we pass the user. So this is going to hit our private helper method. And this private helper method is going to return a user DTO. And that user DTO contains first name, last name, and JWT. And the JWT is being populated by the service that we have created in the previous videos. So a little explanation for here. We are using user manager to find a user. This find by name async is coming from Microsoft ASP.NET Core Identity. And then this will take a username. And based on the username, it's going to fetch the user from the database and provide our user object over here. And if could not find the username, that means the username is invalid. So that's why we return unauthorized. And then we're checking again if the email confirm is false. That means the user has not confirmed the email password. So we return unauthorized again. Please confirm your email. And then we have var result. And using this time from sign in manager, and we're checking for the password. And this check password sign in async is going to take a user again and the password. And for the third argument, if the user has input the false password, so it's going to lock out the user. But for now, we are just simply say don't lock out the user even though they input the wrong password. And then this result will contain some value. And if result that succeeded is false, so that's why I put a question mark, then simply return and authorize again, invalid username or password. And if the user has input the correct password, then create the application user DTO. And for the register method, so I'm going to have HTTP post once again, and I name it as register. So this is when the user is trying to register an account for our application. So I have public async task, and this time I'm going to have I action result, and I name it as register. And we are going to receive a register DTO, and we name it as model, and I open and close the curly brace. So we are going to create this register DTO. So I copy the name, and inside my account, I'm going to have another class, and I name it as register DTO. For the register DTO, we are going to have four properties. The first one is first name. The second one is last name. The third one is email. And the last one is password. So we are going to use the email for both username and email. So that's why I have only one email property over here. I don't have username. So this email is going to be used for both email and the username. And I make all of them as required. So the user has to provide all these properties. For the first name and last name, I'm going to set some limit for the how many characters the, the user can input. So the way I do, I say string length and I open and close parenthesis and it's going to be 15 and mean length is 3 and for the error message I'm going to have first name must be at least 
and maximum characters. So I'm trying to say that the first name has the maximum of 15 characters and minimum of 3 characters. So anything below 3 or above 15, if the user has input for the first name, then they see this error message. And this 2 is referring to 3 and 1 is referring to 15 over here. Then I copy this and I'm going to have the same data annotation for last name. So instead of first name, I specify last name and I'm going to have for the password as well. But for the password, we are going to have for the minimum length, we are going to have six. And over here, I'm going to specify password must be at least three and maximum 15 characters. For the email, I'm going to use a regular expression. So the way I do, I say regular expression and then I open and close the parentheses and I put a quotation over here. And this is going to be my regular expression. And just after closing the quotation, I'm going to have an error message. And I simply say invalid email address. In order to have a regular expression for email, I open my browser and I navigate to regexlib.com. Then inside here, I put email. And if I search, then this is going to give me some regular expression for email verification. So I'm going to pick the easiest one. So I copy this regular expression and I head back to my registerdetail.cs and over here, I paste that in here. Then I head back to my account controller.cs and over here, we are going to use from another private method. So I have private async task and this returns a Boolean and check email exist async and this takes an email address and we are going to make a use of user manager so i say await user manager dot users dot any async and we have an expression so x goes to x x dot email is email dot to lower and i put semicolon so there's a typo so i put check email async and this private method is going to make a use of user manager and from the user class we are going to return a boolean whether true or false if this expression is true and if this finds any email address then it returns true if it doesn't find any email address then it returns false and we are going to check if the user is going to register with the same email address that has already been registered so over here i'm going to have if await check email exists async and I pass model.email if that's true then return a bad request and we say and inside here I'm going to use string interpolation so I put dollar sign and I put the quotation and in here we have an existing account is using and I put the curly brace and inside the bracket I'm going to put model dot email then i put comma email address please try with another email address and i put semicolon so i simply return this message and i say an existing account is using the same email address that the user has posted to this method and please try with another email address if the email does not exist in our record then we say var user to add is new user object and for the first name we are going to have model.first name and for all the properties we are going to convert to lowercase so if the user has some uppercase for the first name or last name we are convert everything to lowercase and for the last name we have model.lastname.toLower and username is model.email.toLower and the email is model.email.toLover. Again, we are using the email address for both username and email address. And for now, we are going to have email confirm is true because we are going to handle email confirmation in the upcoming videos. But for now, we simply say the email confirm is true. And then I put semicolon. Then I'm going to have our result is await user manager that create async and we pass the user to add and model.password so we are going to create a user 
based on the object that we have created and the password that we have. Then we check if not succeeded the result, then return bad request and we simply pass result dot errors. And if everything goes well, then return OK. Your account has been created. You can log in. So with this, our register method has been finished. If I open my SQL management, if I open my identity app database and inside ASP.NET users, if I hit select top thousand, then we don't have any record at the moment. But if the user is providing some value over here and this method is going to create a new row inside my ASP.NET users. Now it's time to test our API controller. So I run my application and I'm going to open my Postman. Then inside here, it's better if you log in inside the Postman application and you can see whether you have logged in or not over here. And then inside the collection, I'm going to use a new collection. So I click on new and then I click on collection. And for the collection, I'm name it as my application identity app. And then I open here and then I'm going to add a folder. Um, my folder is going to be account. So this account is representing our account controller. For the first request, I'm going to add a request and I have register. This is a post method, so I select post. Uh, for the URL, I'm going to copy my URL from launch settings. So I copy this and inside here, I paste it over here and I put forward slash API account and then forward slash register. Then for the body, I click on body and I choose raw and from here, I choose JSON. Then we have to provide a JSON body so and that json body is going to represent our register dto so if i my open my register dto we are going to have first name last name email and password so for the first name we have john and for the last name we have smith and for the email we have jsmith at example.com then for the password we have one two three four five six and if I put a breakpoint inside my register, and if I send, try to send, then I can hit my breakpoint. And if I hover over my model, I have all the properties that I have provided. And I'm going to step forward, so I use this button, and this is going to check if the username is exist. So this returns false. So it, it continues, and if I continue, it's going to create a user object, and provides those property based on the model that we have received. And in here, we are going to create our user inside our ASP.NET user table. And this result is succeeded, so it continues and it returns OK. If I continue, I can see your account has been created. You can log in. And if I open my database once again, and for the ASP.NET users, if I execute, I can see my John Smith has been created and with the password that we have provided. I would like to try with some bad uh, register models. So I open my Postman and in, inside my register, I'm going to use some longer name. So I put more than 15 characters. So I copy this John and I paste it over a couple of times. And if I try to send, then I can see first name must be at least three characters. And if I do the same for my last name. And if I send, I can see these error messages. Last name must be at least three and maximum 15 characters. And if I add some invalid username, I have an invalid username. So if I send, I can see invalid email address. And this is going to compare against that regular expression that we have added. I put everything back to whatever it was and I try to save and I'm going to log in with John Smith so inside my account I'm going to hit these three dots and for the here I'm going to add a new request and I name it as login and this is going to be a post method as well 
and for the URL I'm going to copy this URL and I paste it over here and we have API account login and we are going to click on body and from the raw JSON we have username and password so I head back to my postman and for the username we are going to have whatever username we have created over here so I copy this and I paste it over here and for the password and for the password we are going to have one two three four five six and if I send I can see a body that contains the user DTO that we have created inside our login method and this is the JWT token so if I copy this and if I navigate to the browser and I paste it inside jwt.io I can see these are the, the values that we have provided inside our JWT so we have the name ID, we have the email address, given name, family name and this is my own claim name that I have provided inside my JWT service so this is basically that my own claim name and the value is this is the value if I see this is the value and the expiry date and issue date and the issuer and the issuer is our API URL whatever we have specified over here this is the issuer so since I'm here I'm going to remove this it was for the demo purpose and I'm going to remove this as well and I save and if I press hot reload then this is going to apply the code changes for me without trying to restart the whole application so if I send again and I'm going to remove this breakpoint and I continue then I'm going to have a new JSON web token if I copy this JSON web token and I paste it over here then I don't see that custom claim type that I just created earlier so I'm going to try with a bad username or password so I put one over here if I try to send then I can see invalid username or password and if I correct my username and incorrect the password then I can see the same error message invalid username or password and inside my postman I'm going to save these two inside my collection so if I control s I can see this is, has changed to the post request and for the register I'm going to save it as well in this video I'm going to create another endpoint and that is going to be refresh user token so I stop my application and just above login I'm going to have bracket authorized since this endpoint is going to be accessible for only authorized user only and then I have HTTP get and I name it as refresh user token and for here I have public async task action result and user DTO and I name it as refresh user token so i have misspelled over here so this is refresh user token and then this is going to receive nothing then inside here i'm going to have one user is await user manager dot find by name async and this is going to look for the username if i have it over here this is going to look for a username and how do we retrieve our username since this is an authorized method then the user has provided the JWT bearer and inside the JWT bearer we are having the username inside one of the claims I'm going to retrieve by user that find first claim types and I need to bring using system security that claims that name I put question mark since this might be a nullable and then I put value and from here we are going to return create application user DTO and we pass the user object once again if I try to test this endpoint I'm going to run my application and inside my postman I'm going to have another request and this is going to be HTTP get and the name is refresh user token and for the login I'm going to have the API URL so I put it over here and then API account and refresh user token if I try to hit this endpoint without anything I get an authorized because I'm only allowing the authorized user to access this endpoint if I put a breakpoint over here I'm not going to be caught to this endpoint I'm only seeing 401 unauthorized we need to have a proper JWT 
insert our authorization. So I click on authorization and from here I'm going to choose bearer token. And inside my token, I need to have the proper token. So I'm going to log in once again in order to get a new token. So I send and I'm going to copy this token and I head back to my refresh user token and I paste it over here. And if I send, now my user is authorized. So that's why we can see we are getting caught in this breakpoint. And if I step over, so this is going to, and we have received a system argument null exception. And this is what happens. So we are trying to retrieve username from our claims, but we haven't provided that claims inside our JWT service. So if I look for my claims, I can see only we have provided the email and the name identifier and given name and surname, but we haven't provided, for example, claim types that name. So in order to do that, we can simply add another claims inside our claim types, or we can retrieve the username from the email address since they both are the same. So I'm going to use the second option. Instead of claim types.name, I'm going to use email. And if I save and I hit hot reload, and if I send this request once again, um, I'm going to set forward. And then in this time, we are going to have a user populated inside here based on the user manager find by name async. And this is going to hit my private method once again, and it generates a new token for us. So if I continue and if I see my postman, I can see this is the response that we have received from our API. So for my postman, instead of copying and pasting the application URL, I would like to add a variable inside my disk collection. So inside my identity app, I hit these three dots. And if I click on edit, then inside my variables, I'm going to have URL. And for my URL, I'm going to use the same URL that we are using over here. So I copy this. And inside here, for the initial value, I'm going to paste it over here. And for the current value also, I'm going to place it over here and I'm going to save it. Then I close this and inside my login, instead of this hard coding my URL, I'm going to have double query brace URL and I close my double query brace and as well as for my register. So I'm going to use URL inside here as well. And if I save and save this as well, then we are going to have a proper API collection for ourselves. And I save it over here. If I try login, then I can see the response. And another thing that I would like to do whenever we are trying to login, I would like to save my token inside a global variable. So Inside my login request, I click on test and then I use the following code. So I'm going to have const user and this is going to look for the response. And then from the response, I'm going to have pm.globals.setJWT and user.jwt. So uh, this user is going to be the value that we have received from the API. And from that value, we are looking for user.jwt, which is here. There are token that we are seeing over here. And this will set the JWT variable based on whatever we have over here inside our global variables. So if I save this and I can access to that JWT variable inside my refresh user token. So instead of copying and pasting the token manually, I'm going to remove this and I'm going to have JWT over here. And if I save, so if I log in, then I'm going to have that JWT provided over here. And this JWT, if I send, then I can see I'm getting cut in this breakpoint. So if I remove my breakpoint and if I continue, I can see a new JWT has been created. And I can save this new JWT over here as well. 
So if I open my login and from the test, I copy this and for my refresh user token, I do the same. So I click on test and I paste that over here as well. So this is the end of this section. I'm going to push my changes into GitHub. So I stop my application and I click on Git changes. I make a comment as 02. This represents our section number two, API project setup, SVNet core identity added. And I commit all my changes and I push to GitHub. In this section, we are going to set up our Angular project. So first of all, we need to install Node.js and after that, we need to install Angular CLI. You have two options to install Node.js. For the first option, you can navigate to Node.js. After you navigate to Node.js, then click on other downloads. And from here, I click on all downloads and I look for 18.10. So if I double click on two dots and then I can see 18.10 over here. This one. And then based on your operating system, you can install that Node.js. But there's another alternative way. If you want to have multiple Node.js, then there's another alternative way by installing NVM. So you can install NVM based on your operating system. But since I'm using Windows, I show you how to install NVM on Windows. So search NVM install Windows. Before installing NVM, you need to uninstall any current version of Node.js from your machine. And after uninstalling, then search for NVM install Windows and click on this GitHub link. And from here, you can choose or click on download now. And from here, you can click on NVM setup.exe. Then you can install NVM. And after you have successfully installed NVM, if you open your command in as administrator, then you can verify that by doing nvm list. So right now I have three Node.js installed on my machine, but I'm going to install Node.js version 18.10. So the way I do nvm install 18.10.0. Now this is going to install my Node.js for my machine and I can choose nvm use 18.10.0. So now if I do node dash dash version, I can see my node version is 18.10. And if you are having another application using another Node.js, so this is the alternative way to have multiple Node.js rather than uninstalling and installing another node version. After this, we are going to install Angular CLI. So if I do ng, it says ng is not recognized. So we need to install that. So the way I do, I say npm install minus g at angular cli at 15 we are going to use from angular 15 and if i do ng version i can verify that by running this command so i can see my angular cli is 15.2.5 my node is 18.10 and npm is 8.19 so after we have successfully installed both Node.js and Angular CLI, then I navigate to my app folder and from here I type cmd in order to run command prompt inside this folder. Then I say ng new and I name it as client app and I press enter. And you ask for would you like to add uh, Angular routing? I say yes. And then we are going to use from CSS. And this takes a while. Okay, after installing my Angular project, I can see inside here client app. So I can navigate to my client app. So I say cd client app, and then I type code dot. So I'm going to open my Angular site from Visual Studio code. So I say yes, I trust the author, and I can see my Angular project has been installed successfully. So I can open the terminal from here and I say ng serve o in order to run the project. 
Okay, my Angular site is up and running and everything is working as normal. In this section, we are going to clean up our Angular project. So I close all my other tabs and I open my Node.js and from here I open my source app and I open my app.component.html and we are going to delete everything and we are going to have simply identity app inside a p tag and if I save I can see identity app now I would like to install bootstrap and we are going to use from ngx bootstrap so if I search for ngx bootstrap and the first link so we're going to install ngx bootstrap version 10 so if I click on get it started so I can see at the bottom I can see version 10 is compatible with angular 15 and that's the same version as we are using so I'm going to make a use of that so I navigate to the top and we are going to install ngx bootstrap using ng add so I copy this and I open my terminal so from Visual Studio Code, I click on plus button and this will open a new terminal for me. So I can paste that over here and I'm going to specify the version. So I put add and I put 10 over here. So we are going to install ngx bootstrap version 10. That's the same version as we are seeing over here. And I press enter. And this is asking, would you like to proceed? I say yes. And this has updated my package.json, angular.json, and my app.module. So if I open my app.module, it has added browser animation module. And inside my angular.json, I can see it has added these two line of code. And also as well as the package.json. So if I open my package.json, I can see ngx bootstrap over here version 10. And this has installed bootstrap for me as well. So the version of the bootstrap we're using is 5. I can verify that my bootstrap has been installed. Since we have updated the angular.json files, we need to restart our Angular application. So I press Ctrl C and I put ng serve once again. And this time if I refresh, I can see a different format for my p tag. So this verifies that bootstrap has been installed inside my Angular application. In this video, we are going to create a bunch of components and folder structure our Angular project. So I close all the tabs and from the app folder, I right click and I hit new folder and I name it as shared. So this is going to include every shared components or modules that are going to be used among the entire application. And then I navigate to SRC app and share and I create a module so I say so I type ngGM shared and I make it as flat so this has created a shared module for myself and then I right click on share and I create a new folder and I name it as components and inside components so I navigate to components and from here I create another folder and I name it as errors so this is containing the error components so I navigate to errors as well and in here I'm going to create two components so I say ngGC and the first one is not found and I skip the tests so this is the not found page for my application and then I'm going to create another and I say ngGC and I name it as validation messages and I skip test as well and this is the validation messages that we receive from the API so we're going to deal with these two components later on and then I navigate back to my app folder so I say I put bunch of dots to navigate back to SRC app and in here I'm going to create a component called navbar so I say ngGC navbar and I skip test since we're not using any testing for Angular project. So if I minimize my shared, I can see navbar over here. And then I'm going to create footer and as well as home. 
and we are going to have account folder as well but that account folder is going to contain bunch of router links so the way i do i say nggm and i name as account so if i press enter inside my app folder this is going to create account module and it puts into a folder called account and that account is representing for my account controller inside my api so if i see i can see account module over here so i navigate to account and i'm going to create another module for routing so i say nggm and account dash routing and i make it as flat if i don't do flat then it's going to create account routing inside a new folder but if i do flat it's going to put it inside the same folder and then i'm going to create the service for my account so i say nggs and account and I skip tests and I'm going to create uh, two components one of them is login and one of them is register so I say nggc and login and I skip test and I do for register and if I open my account module I can see login and register are declaring inside declaration in this section we are going to lay out our website so i open my app.component.html and first of all i remove my p tag and i'm going to replace with app nav bar so we are going to have a nav bar at the top of the page and after here we are going to have div.container dot margin top five so i'm using bootstrap class container and margin top five and i'm going to give it a style mean height 700 pixel and inside here i'm going to have my router outlet and after here i'm going to have my footer and if i save i can see navbar works and footer works so this is a little too long so i'm going to remove 700 and instead i'm going to have 500 so i can see navbar works and footer works but i don't see the home page over here so we are going to create our routes inside our app routing module so i open app routing module and inside routes i press enter and i'm going to give the first one path and for the default we are going to use home component and i put comma and then for path not found we are going to use from not found component and another path for any path that is not assigned over here so we put double asterisk and we're going to navigate to not found component as well and we put path match full if i save the app routing module and if i open i can see home works over here because this is going to put our home components inside the default path and this is the default path and for the not found if i copy this and i put forward slash not found we can see not found over here and for any other path that is not defined so i put one two three and not found will appear as well because because that is going to be triggered by this code so any path that has not been assigned we are going to forward it to not found component and i'm going to assign my account routing module as well so the way i do i say const routes of type route so i need to import angular routes so i can see that has been imported equals and we're going to have path and for the login we're going to have login component and for the register so i copy this and i paste it 
down here so we are going to have register and this is going to be register component and then we are not using any common modules inside our account routing module so I remove that and instead we are going to have router module and for child we are going to pass the routes that we have assigned over here and since we are inside another routing module we need to export it as well so I say exports and router module and then we are going to import router module inside our account module so I copy router module and inside my account router and inside my account module I'm going to have imported as well over here so I control dot and add the import in this way we are going to import account routing module inside our account dot module and then we are going to open app routing module and we are going to use lazy loading so the way I do I enter over here and I'm going to have a new path and this is account and load children and we have a callback function import and we are going to import the account module so I'm going to go inside account and account module and then we have then option and module and module dot account module and I put comma over here so with this we have implemented the lazy loading so if I put a comma so this will load my account modules whenever we are going to navigate it to account router if I save and I open my browser so instead of uh, this I'm going to have account then I have forward slash login so if I do this I can see login is not appearing so there must be some misspelling so the error was inside my account that module we need to import account routing module instead of account module so that was a mistake there so I remove my router module from account module but instead we are going to in import account routing module and if I save and if I navigate back to my browser so now I can see account and if I put login so I have been navigated to login components and I can see login works if I do register I can see register works so in this video we're going to code our navbar so I open my navbar.component.html and we remove the existing and we start with header then we have nav So we have nav with a class of navbar, navbar expand large, navbar dark, and bg primary. Then we have div.container. And after here we have a. And we remove the href. And for here we have img, src, assets, images logo.png and we have class of me3 and alt is logo inside this section we have a logo.png file so you can download that and after you have downloaded there so you are going to copy and paste that inside our asset so I'm going to create a new folder and I name it as images and and this is the logo that we are going to use so I drag and drop over here and this is a simple just a PNG file and this is our logo for our application and if I save and I open my browser I can see identity app over here so I have misspelled container this should be container so if I see I can see this has been pushed a little forward and after here we have a button And inside our button we have a span so this is a hamburger button for open and close our navbar for mobile devices or a smaller screens 
then we have div dot and inside my div we have ul dot and then we have li dot nav item and for the first one we have a dot nav link and we have home over here and i copy this and i paste down here and we have play if i take a look i can see home and play over here and then we are going to have another ul and inside here we are going to have li.navitem and here we are going to have a tag dot btn dot and for the a tag we remove the href as well and here we have create account and i copy this and i paste it down here and for here we are going to have login and I remove the MX2 as well. So if I save everything, I take a look at my browser. This is the page that we have currently. So we're going to design our footer as well. So I open my footer and footer.component.html. And from here, I remove the existing code and I say footer. And after here, we have div. And here we have H6. So we are going to create our current year inside our footer.component.ts. So I copy this and I open my footer.component.ts. Then over here we have current year equals new date dot get full year. And if I save, and I open my browser, I can see copyright 2023 identity app. Okay, let's set up our navigation. For example, if we click play home or create account, so we want to navigate to those uh, URLs. So first of all, I open my share.module and then we are going to import router module. So I press enter and say router module. And then we need to export this as well. So I say export and I put router module over here and inside my app router module I need to import my shared module. So we are going to import shared module inside our app module over here and inside our shared module since we are going to use this shared module inside other components that's why I have imported router module inside my shared module and by importing router module we will be able to use from router link and then i open my navbar.component.html and inside here i'm going to have router link and forward slash so this is the default route for my home component and that's representing over here so i navigate back to my html and for play, I'm going to have router link forward slash play. We don't have the play component yet. We're going to create very soon. And for my create account, I'm going to do the same. So we are going to navigate it to account and forward slash register. And I copy this and I paste it over here. And instead of register, we are going to be navigated to login. So if I save everything, and I navigate back to my website. So if I click create account, I can see register work. If I click login, I can see login works. If I click on home, home works. But play doesn't uh, work because we don't have that at the moment. So I'm going to create that uh, over here. So inside my second terminal, I navigate back to my app module. And in here, we are going to create our play component. So ngGC and play, and I skip test. So this play component, uh, we're not uh, going to touch in this course, but this is going to be only visible for any authorized user. So that's why I have created a dummy play component, and but we're not going to touch it uh, anyway in this course. 
So I have to open my app routing module and I have to create another path for my play. So I copy the first one, I paste it down here and instead we have play. And for the component, we have play component. So if I say, and if I click, I can see play component works. So now I would like to add the active link and instead of white, I want to be brown. I open my navbar.component.html and in here we are going to have router link active and I pass active class. So I copy this um, for every router that we are going to do, I paste that over there. And for the active, we are going to create a class inside my navbar.component.css. So we have active and color is simply brown. And this needs to be important. So I uh, put question mark and importance. If I select important, then this will overwrite any other classes that has been defined inside Bootstrap. So now I can see if I click in any of the link that is active, I can see active class has been applied. But for the home, I can see it's even though we are inside the create account, I can see that has been selected as well. So in order to uh, fix that issue, we need to have another option. And that is going to be inside a square bracket. We have router link active options. Um, for the options, we are going to have exact colon true. And if I format everything, so we have to have this as well. So if I save, then that has been resolved. In this video, I would like to install a new template for my website. So I navigate to Boots Watch. And we are going to use from Bootswatch template uh, for Bootstrap. So on top of our Bootstrap, we are going to apply a new template and we are going to make a use of this, the first one. So inside here, uh, I open a new terminal and I say npm install Bootswatch and I press enter. And then I have to open angular.json and I copy this down and we are going to node modules and boots watch and this and then we are going to put another forward slash and inside here we are going to make a use of this so i copy the name and i put it here but instead of uh, capital c i put it lowercase c and this has to be node modules boots watch and this we don't need CSS and uh, the template and bootstrap dot so I remove mean dot CSS so if I save and since we have modified our angular dot JSON we need to restart our angular application so I'm going to stop my angular and then I do ng serve after we have restarted our angular site if I refresh my website I can see the effect of the template that we have installed on top of our bootstrap. And that is exactly the same template as we see. If you would like to try another template, you just need to simply replace the name from here to any other template that you would like to see. Okay, now we want to design our login and register page. So I open my login.component.html and I close all other tabs. And in here, I remove the p tag, and we are going to have div dot. Then we have div dot. Then we have main. And after here, we have for. And we don't need action, so I remove that. And I put enter. And in here, we have div dot. And inside my div, we are going to have h3 and we have login and after my div we are going to have another div 
and inside here we have input and the class is form control the type is text and placeholder is username and after the input we have a label and I copy this and we are going to have another div of form floating and this is going to be password and the type is password and after this we are going to have div dot and in here we have button dot and the type is submit and we have log in and after my form we are going to have another div and in here we have a dot btn and we remove the href and inside my a tag we have h6 so if i save and take a look at my website if I navigate to my login, I can see login over here. So this has to be in the center. So and after justify content, we have center. So I can see login and this is the form and this is the password and this is the button for login. So I'm using simple bootstrap classes. The first one is dflex, so we're using dflex and justify content center. Then we are going to have call 12 and for a smaller we have call 5. So for larger uh, screen we have call 5, but for smaller we have call 12. So if I restart, if I resize my browser, I can see this is call 12, but if I make it as a larger, so this is call 5. And these are all basic bootstrap classes that I'm not going to go over, but uh, we're using bootstrap in order to have a good looking application. And inside my form, we have a login. So this is the login that we see. And after that, we are going to have a form group. Before it used to be form group, but now we are using from form floating. So there is no more form group for bootstrap 5. So we are using form floating and we have an input and label. And we have one for the username and one for the password. And at the bottom we have login button over here. So that's how we can see the layout of my login component. Okay, I now we get back to my login component. And so we don't have the username, but uh, we're using email as both for the email address and the username. So I switch username into email and this should be email. And if I take a look, so I can see email for my login page. So we're using email in order to be able to log to the application. And for my create account, so I would like to update the HTML. So I copy the whole thing from login component and then I navigate to my register component of HTML. Then I remove the existing P tag and I paste that over here. For the login, I remove this and I press enter and we have let's. And for here we have email and password, but uh, before email, uh, we are going to have first name and last name. So I copy this div and then just above here, I put two more time so we have for the first one we have first name and the four is should be first name and placeholder should be first name as well and the second one is last name so I copy this and I paste it over here and for the four we have last name and if I save and I take a look at my create so we have first name last name email and password so instead of login we are going to have create account and we don't need the forgot username and password for registration so I remove this and if I save 
I can see my registration forms. Okay, let's finish registration.ts. So I open register.component.ts. Then we are going to implement an init. So I say implement an init. I put my cursor and control dot. So I implement interface and init. Then I'm going to have a constructor. And inside my constructor, I'm going to have private account service of type account service. So I'm injecting my account service inside registration.component.ts. And then I put the open and close very brace. And then I'm going to make a use of for builder so i say pirate form builder of type form builder we are going to make a use of reactive forms in order to bind our form and submit our form so the way i do i'm going to have a register form at the top of type form group so we cannot see that because we need to import inside the shared module so i open my shared module and inside the imports i'm going to import reactive form modules so it's reactive forms module and i need to import it from at angular.com we need to import reactive forms from angular forms so i fix the error and we are going to export reactive forms as well since we are going to make a use of this inside shared module and we are importing shared module inside our account module so i'm missing that I need to import shared module over here. If I import shared module, then I'm going to be able access to any imports that we currently have inside the exports. So we can make a use of router module and reactive forms inside my account module. And if I go back to my register.component.ts and now I can update my import. Before I couldn't update because uh, I had to import reactive forms. And then it's new form group and we pass empty object as an initial value then i'm going to have a property called submitted and i make it false by default and error messages and this is the array of a string and i initialize it to empty array so this uh, contains any error messages that uh, returns from the api and here we have initialized form and inside here we have this dot register form is this dot form builder dot group so for the properties we are going to have first name and this we initialize to empty string and for the validators we have validators that require it and we need to bring validators from at angular forms and the second validators is validators dot min length three and validators dot max length 15. so the same validators that we are doing inside our dto's so if i open my dto's account and register dto so we have min minimum of three characters and maximum of 15 characters and this is required so three validators for first name and we are assigning three validators for first name and i put a comma and i paste three more times so we're going to have the second one as last name the same validators and for email we are going to have another validators instead of min length and max length so i remove these two and instead we are going to have make a use of regular expression so the same way as we have over here so i copy this regular expression from this all the way to the, the dollar sign i'm going to copy that and then inside here i'm going to have validators dot pattern so that's how we can assign the regular expression validator inside my email property inside register for then the last one is password and for the password we have min length of six characters and max length of 15 and inside my ng on init i need to call my initialized form so i say this that initialized form in order to call this method and initializing my form so after I do this, I can come back to register.component.html and bind my form into the form that we have created over here. So the way I do, I put a square bracket and I say form group equals register form. The same as we have named it over here. And then for the ng submit, we call register and autocomplete off. 
So for the ng submit, if the form is submitted by this button, then this will call this function. We don't have this function yet. That's why we see red. So I copy that and inside my register.ts, I'm going to create that function. And then for autocomplete, uh, if we don't do uh, autocomplete up, then it automatically completes the form. So we don't want that. That's why we say autocomplete off. And then for each input, we are going to bind into our properties inside the form. So for the first name, uh, and this is for the first name. So we say form control name equals first name. And when we do this, then this input has been connected to the first name inside register form. And I'm going to do the same for all other. So I copy this and inside the last name, I'm going to place and as well as email and for the password. So I just make the modification. And I open my register.component.ts and then I can say console.log this.registerForm.value. And I'm going to save everything. So let's take a look at what we have so far. So if I create an account and if I open my console, if I put a first name, last name, and email address, and one four five six for the password, then if I create, if I open my console right, then I can see my register form values. So email first name, last name, and password. So I close this. Then I head back to my register method. So inside here, we are going to say this dot submitted is true. So we know that the form has been submitted or the create button has been clicked. And then we say this dot error messages is to initialize empty error messages. So why I'm doing this? Because I would like to print out any error messages that we see from the API. And after this, I'm going to call my account service. But we need to create the register method inside my account service. So I open my account service. And inside my constructor, I need to inject HTTP client. So I say private HTTP colon of type HTTP client. And we don't see that here because we need to import HTTP client module inside our shared module. So I open my shared module and inside imports, I'm going to have HTTP client module. And if I control dot, I cannot see any fix. So because I think uh, I have a capital L, and if I try one more time, I don't see that. So I'm going to manually import that. So I copy this, and in here I have import HTTP client module from at Angular forward slash comment forward slash HTTP, and we need to export that as well. So if I do this, then I can see add import from at angular common HTTP. So we are using HTTP client in order to make an API call. And then in here, I'm going to have register method. So register, and this takes a model of register, and we need to create our models as well. And then this has return this.http dot get dot post and we need to provide the url and the model so this is the app url and i put comma and then we have the model so first of all i need to create my register model so i'm going to do uh, by navigating to shared folder and then i right click and i create a new folder and i name it as models and inside here i'm going to have my register ts so i right click and i click on new file and i name it as register.ts and inside here we have export interface register and we have first name of type string then i copy three more time last name email and password so the same model as we have inside register.dto then i head back to my account.service and i'm i can make a 
import for my register model so add import from uh, it goes to the path of this model that i have created inside shared folder we are going to have our app URL inside environment.ts so inside angular 15 we don't have environment.ts anymore but we can generate that very easily so if i navigate to the angular side there's a command of ng generate environment so i copy this and inside my tab inside client i'm going to paste the command and hit enter then this has created my environment.ts and environment dot development dot ts and it has updated my angular dot json so we can make a use of that so this new folder has been created for me so i open environment dot development dot ts and inside here we are going to have the following properties so the first one is production and we say false so we defining that the production version is false and then we have app url and this is the url of my api so i can copy that from my api project and inside properties launch settings and this is the app url of my api so i copy this and then i paste it over here and then since we are here we are going to have another constant variable that is user key and i name it as identity app user and we have to copy all this and paste it inside environment.ts as well so i open that and inside here for the production we have true and for the app url we don't have uh, but for the user key we have the same key so i'm going to explain user key later on in this section but since we are here i have put it over here then i head back to account.service and i can make a use of that app url so my app url i'm going to make a use of backtick and I remove the existing and I have dollar sign and I open and close Cerebrus environment make sure to bring from environment dot development then app URL and then we have forward slash API then account then register and we are going to pass the model as well so this is fixed and we can head back to register.component.ts and instead of console logging the value i'm going to call the api so i say this dot account service dot register and i'm going to pass my register form so i say this dot register form dot value and then we are going to subscribe and for the subscription i open and close parentheses and inside my parentheses i have carry brace and we have next option and this is response and we have error option um, for the error i'm going to console.log my error and for the response i'm going to console log my response as well so i remove this console.log uh, register that value you might wonder our register function inside the account service if i go to definition is expecting a model of type register that we just uh, created earlier but uh, we are passing the register form so uh, that's the same thing because in my register form we have the same properties as we have inside the register model so it has first name last name email and password and inside my register.ts we have the exact same properties with the ex exact same spelling that's why we can do that so if i do this.register.value this is going to copy all the values that are already in inside my register form and place it inside the register interface basically inside this model and then we are going to pass that model into the api and since this returns an observable so if i hover over i can see this is observable of object and for every observable we need to subscribe to the observable so if i open my register.ts that's why we are subscribing otherwise it doesn't complete the action so we always need to subscribe to any observable and let's try this so if i save and i open my angular and i have aaa bbb and aa at yahoo.com and one two three four five six and i open my console so I need to run my API project and I put a breakpoint over here. So 
So if I create, I can see another error message and this is cross origin request blocked. So we need to add course inside our API. So the way I do, I open my API project and inside my program.ts, that's underneath of the services and after builder.services add authentication, I have builder dot services dot add course and inside my pipeline just above everything i'm going to have so i enter after i configure the http request pipeline and just above all the pipelines i'm going to have app dot use course and we have opt then inside opt we have opt dot allow any headers dot allow any method dot allow credentials dot with origins and then we have to pass the URL of my client application. And the URL of my client application is localhost colon 4200. So I copy this. Then I can do paste it over here. Or instead, I can copy this URL inside my app setting development and bring that from my app setting development.json. So I rather do that because we are going to need this. Uh, client url in multiple places so instead of just modifying in all over places i would like to only modify in one place so i open my app settings at development and then inside jwt i'm going to have another property and i name it as client url and i call it i put a column and then inside quotation i paste the url of my client and then i head back to program.cs and instead of hard coding that, I'm going to have builder.configuration. And then inside bracket, we are going to have JWT colon client URL. And I put a semicolon at the required places. So with this, we are going to bring the client URL from JWT section inside our app settings. And if I restart my API project, and I'm going to do the same action one more time so my api project has been restarted and if i create then we are going to get caught inside this breakpoint and if i hover over then i can see all the values that has been passed and if i continue so this is the result that we have received okay now let's handle validation for our forms so i open my register.component.html and in here we are going to do client side validation and for the client side validation that we have assigned over here so we have validators that required and patterns so we are going to implement that inside our html so first of all i need to assign is invalid class which is a bootstrap class to if the form and for this input is invalid or basically has errors so the way i do i after here i um, put new line and inside the bracket i have class dot is invalid and then we have a condition and for the condition is if the form is submitted and i put double ampersand and then register for then dot get and we have first name dot errors and this says object is possibly not so we put a question mark to get uh, rid of the error so basically we are injecting is invalid class to the class if the form is submitted and we have that property over here submitted and it is initially false but if the form is submit so we are going to call register method and inside register method we are setting this submitted to true so if the form is submitted that's the first condition and if this uh, first name inside register form has errors and what are the errors we have uh, specified requires and min length and max length if any errors then we are assigning is invalid class into our uh, input class so basically we are going to have for example is invalid over here if these two conditions are true so i remove this and then after my label we are going to have pan class extender and we have asterisk ng if and submitted and i put double ampersand register form dot get first name question mark dot has error and required then 
uh, we are going to have this uh, following text message and we say first name is required and then i head back to register that component and inside here we are going to say if this dot register form dot is valid or valid if the form is valid then pass it with the api call otherwise don't pass it so i don't want to just call my api at the moment so if i save everything and i open my browser and if i click submit then I can see first name is required. Why? Because we have specified over here. So by this line of code and as well as this line of code. And this is going to check if the form is submitted and this has the required um, validation. And we have another validation for first name, which is min length and max length. So I can do over here. So I copy my span and just below that I'm going to have so after submitted and double ampersand, I hit a new line and then for here we have has error of min length or has error of max length. Then for the message, I'm going to copy exactly the same message as I have over here. First name must be at least and maximum. So I copy this and then I head back here and first name must be at least for the first one is 3 and maximum is 15 so if i save and i would like to test if i hit i can see first name is required but as soon as i put a character i can see the second option first name must be at least 3 and maximum 15 characters so i'm going to do the same for the last name so i copy these two span and i put it underneath and instead of first name we are going to have last name so i copy a last name and for the get i'm going to have last name and uh, i have a misspell here so this is max length instead of mas and uh, i paste last name over here as well and i make the modification for the message and we have last name and we have to apply the is invalid class to this input as well so i copy this just after here i hit a new line and i paste that in here and instead of first name we have last name so this is exactly matching or i can say this uh, characters or spelling is exactly matching my last name so we have lowercase l with capital case n and we have the same as over here and i'm going to do the same for my email address so i copy the is invalid and i paste it over here we have email and for the spam we are going to have the required so i copy that and i paste it so i copy this and i paste it just below label and we have for the email and we can say email is required and we are going to have another additional validation for email which is validating the email address so i copy the spam one more time and here instead of required we have pattern so if the pattern doesn't match then we can say invalid email address and for the password we do just before testing we do the password as well so i copy the is invalid and i paste it over here and i have for the get we have the password and we are going to have the required as well so i copy this and i paste it down here and we have the get for password and we can say password is required and we also have the min length and max length for the password so i copy this one and i paste it down here and i just format my page then we are going to have register form dot get password min length and password max length so if min length or max length uh, is not uh, satisfactory to the register form then display this message and this should be password password must be at least three and maximum 15 but i believe for the password we have six characters so if i head back to register that component yeah we have six characters so i'm going to save everything and try to submit my form if i hit submit i can see all the required fields 
and as soon as I put some characters, I can see three and maximum. If I go beyond 15 characters, then I can see the same message over here. And for the email, I'm going to put some invalid email address. And as soon as I put valid email address, then this has gone. And for the password, I, uh, we have to put six characters. And if I satisfy everything, then we are going to be fine and be able to submit a form. This section, we are going to implement the API validation error messages that we are going to receive by submitting the form. So first of all, I'm going to comment out this line because I would like to see what type of error messages that we are going to receive. So if I uh, save everything and then I head back to my browser and I'm this time I'm going to open my console. And if I submit, so this is the error message that we receive. These are the client side validation but we would like to have the api side validation as well so for the api validation we have object and inside the object we have error and then inside there we have errors and inside the errors we see bunch of error messages so for for example the first name field is required the name must be 3 and 15 characters and so on so we would like to have those error messages lined up over uh, just create account button. So in order to do that, first of all, we need to flatten our API errors into an object. And we can achieve that by modifying our services. So I open my Visual Studio and I open my program.cs. Then inside my services, after builder.services.add course, I'm going to have another service. So first of all, I need to stop my API application. Then we have builder.services.configure and then we have API behavior options. And then we have options. And then inside options, we have invalid response factory is action context. And then we have var errors is action context dot model state dot where x goes to x x dot value dot errors dot count greater than zero if we have multiple errors then dot select many and then we have x goes to x dot x value dot errors and then we are going to select x goes to x dot error message dot to array then from here i'm going to have var to return is I'm going to make a use of anonymous object so I just put new and then inside new we have errors is error and then I'm going to return new bad request object result and I pass my to return and I put the following semicolons so if I run my API and we are going to see different error message over browser so if i submit so this is the previous error message and if i submit then we can see inside error and errors then we have flattened array of error messages so rather than having that inside a bunch of objects we have in a single array of strings and this line of code is doing that so basically it's going to the model state and if uh, it has found some errors and the count is greater than zero then that means we have some errors then we are going to select many of those errors and inside those select many we are going to only select the error message so if i open my browser and for the error message these are all the error messages that we have for example the email field is required and for those error messages we are going to convert it to array and then inside my errors we have a string array of errors and then we are making an anonymous object that's why we don't have the type so it's only new and inside curry brace we are going to have our property called errors and this errors is going to be populated by errors and then we are returning our uh, object that's how we can see latin error messages inside here so we can make a use of that so i head back to my component register.component.ts then inside here i'm going to say if error dot error dot errors if we have error dot error dot errors that's that's basically this one error so 
the first one is error and the second one is error and the third one is errors if we have that then we say this dot error messages is error dot error dot errors and i'm going to remove my console lock so i'm going to save and i try to submit my form so we need to pass those error messages inside our html to the child component of validation uh, messages that we created earlier so the way we do I open my register.component.ts and after uh, my last div of the form floating so we are going to have div dot form floating and then I have a condition so asterisk ng if error messages dot length is greater than zero if we have some errors then we have app validation messages so we don't see that because we need to export that component inside our shared module so if i open my shared module then we have validation messages component but we don't have that inside the exports so in order to make a use of that we need to export it inside here as well if i'm done with this then i can see validation messages coming over here and this validation messages is expecting to receive some input string and if i open my validation dot validation dash messages we are going to have at input then i need to import input from at angular core and error messages of type string array or undefined then i open my validation messages.component.html so i remove this and instead we have ul dot text danger then we have ng if error messages so if this error messages is not defined then we have a for loop inside li so i have i put li and then i have asterisk ng4 and let error of error messages so i copy error messages and then i open a new line and then inside double curly brace we have error so we are looping through error messages and we are going to display that and our validation messages is going to receive that error messages by input so we can pass error messages to the child component so if I open my register.component.html, then we can pass that by using the bracket. So I can say error messages equals error messages. So this error messages inside bracket is referring to the error messages inside the child component. So if I go to definition, this is coming over here. If I head back and this error message is is inside our register.component.ts so with all this if i save then we are going to expect to see some messages over here so i close my console log and if i hit I create account then these are all the messages that we receive from the api and these are all the messages that we receive from the client so if i execute my sql server then i can see aaa at yahoo.com has been registered so i'm going to try registering another user with exact email address so i copy this because inside my api project and inside register we are going to check if the email exists if the email exists then we are returning some bad request so i put back the console lock i want to show you another uh, type of error so i put this, this back and then i'm going to save and this time i'm going to register with the same username that we already have registered because i would like to see this error message i head back to my browser and i put some random character for the first name and last name but for the email we are going to use the same email address that we already have registered once before so i put a password and i open my console log and if i create account then i continue then we have different error messages and this one and the error is not an object it's just a simple text message so we need to handle that as well so in order to do this after this if statement we have else and then we can push that error inside our error messages the way i do is this.error messages.push 
error dot error why we are using this dot error message dot push because because this is a string characters it is not an array of object so before it used to be an array of multiple strings but this time it's only just a single string so that's why we are just pushing in this case our bad request for this scenario is being handled by this line of code and if i save and i'm going to do register with the same email address and if i create account i continue then i can see the error message that i saw from my bad request and i'm going to remove my console lock and since we already handled the error messages so we are going to put back in the if condition if the form is valid then bother calling the api and i save everything in this section we are going to handle the success message that we receive from the api so if i try to register with a good username for the email i'm going to use something that i haven't registered yet then if i hit create account i'm going to uh, remove my breakpoint and if i continue then i can see object object so why do i see that because this is going to return a string but we're not expecting to receive a string so we can make a modification to our api and instead of returning a simple string so i cut this and then instead we are going to return new json result and then we have new anonymous object once again and we can have title is account created and for the message we can have your account has been created so i remove uh, the extra characters over here and i close the parentheses so instead of just returning a simple string we are returning a json result and this is an up and this returns an object so if i restart my api application i try to register with a new user so this time i'm going to use joe and if i try to create account then i can see a result and this is the result that we just received and inside the value we have message and we have title so uh, exactly the same as we specified over here so title and message so we would like to show this message in a model or in a notification so the way we do we can make a use of ngx bootstrap so if i type ngx bootstrap and then if i go to the website and get it started and for the components we can make a use of models so if i open this and these are the models that we can make a use of for notification or pop-up so i'm going to make a use of this one so we need to create a component for this model and i'm going to create that inside my shared folder so inside my shared folders and inside the components i'm going to create another folder and i name it as models So I just say minimize my errors and inside components we have errors and we have models and inside my models I'm going to create that component so I need to navigate to that and in here we have NGGC notification and we have skip test so we have notification model and this is going to be used for both success and error messages you can think of toaster notification like this so this notification is going to be a pop-up message that the user will see and that is going to have the following properties is success of type boolean and initially it is true then we have title of type string and we set it to empty string and message and string and we have empty string as well then we are going to have a constructor so i say constructor and public bs modal ref of type bs modal ref we don't see that over here because we need to import that inside our shared module so if i go back to the ngx bootstrap and inside apis i can see we need to import modal module in, inside our modules so i copy this and i head back to my shared module then i paste it over here and then i copy my modal module and 
for the imports i'm going to uh, have that over here and for the modal module we are going to have four roots if i uh, take a look we need to have modal module dot for root then if i open my notification dot component dot ts then i can import that from here and then i open my notification dot component dot html and i remove the existing code and instead i'm going to use the example that i just showed you so the, se the second one with the components so i'm going to copy this line of code from the template and then i paste it over here and i try to reformat so inside my header i'm going to have ng class and i'm going to assign bg success if is success and assign bg danger if it is not is success so since we are in, uh, having is success as a boolean if this is true then apply bg success class otherwise apply bg danger so the header becomes green or red and then i remove this ul tag instead we are going to have message and then i have ok over here so we don't have that close button so we are receiving these properties from inside our components and we are and then we can have another service called shared service and that populates or triggers this model for us so the way i do inside my terminal i head back to shared folder so i have to go two more times up and then inside my shared i'm going to have ngs shared and i skip test so my shared service has been created inside my shared folder then inside here we are going to have private modal service of type bs modal service so i need to import that from ngx bootstrap forward slash modal then we are going to have a method called show notification and we are going to receive three arguments the first one is success of type boolean the second one is, is title of type string and the third one is message of type string so i have a extra forward slash then inside here we have const initial state of modal options so we need to bring that and is very brace initial state column and we pass those properties to the model and then we have this the bs model ref so we need to have bs model ref as a property so i say bs model ref of bs model ref and this has to be initialized and i need to bring uh, my bs model ref and this has to be uh, initialized so in order to get rid of that i can say this can be undefined so that's how we put question mark over here to get rid of the error message then i can say bs model ref is this dot model service dot show and we pass the notification component and we pass the initial state so all this code is coming from this example so we ha can have initial state and then we can pass those initial state to the component that we created so in our case is notification component and we have created this function inside our shared service because we can make a use of this function in any places inside our client application then i head back to my register.component and in here we can have this dot shared service so i need to bring shared service so i head back to the top and i can inject private shared service of type shared service then inside here we can say this dot shared service dot show notification the function that we created and this expecting three properties so the first one is true because this is a success message and then the second option is the title so i need to say that my response is of type any then i can say response dot value dot title and then i can say response dot value dot message and then we can navigate back to the account logging so i can say this dot router so i need to bring router so inside my constructor i can have private router of type router and i need to bring my router and over here we can have this dot router dot navigate by url and just forward the user to the login page so 
you can say account login and if i remove my console log so let's try all this i'm gonna save everything and i open my browser and i'm going to register with a new user so i can see the notification that i just created account created your account has been created you can log in this is exactly the same message that we have over here Okay, I'm going to finish up this section with uh, completing login. So uh, login is going to be the same as register. So we need to initialize the form. So I copy this and inside my login.component.ts, I'm going to have the method. And then instead of register form, we name it as login form. And I head back to the register component and I'm going to copy the properties and I head back to login. And I'm gonna paste them over here. Then I add all missing imports. Then we are going to have the constructor. So I open register component and for the constructor, I copy this and I paste it over here. We don't need the shared service, so I remove this. Then we need to have ng on init. So we have implements on init and we need to bring. So I use add all missing imports. Then we have to have ng on init. So Inside my register component.ts, I'm going to copy this and I head back to login.ts. Then I paste it over here. And for the login form, we have name as login form. So I copy login form and instead of register form, I just substitute with login form. And inside our login, we are going to have username and password. So the form gets uh, much simpler. So we have username and the password so i remove this last name and first name and for both of them we are going to have only the required attributes so i remove all the way this bracket and we have only one single validation which is required and i do the same for the password so i cut this and i paste it with this then we are going to have a login method and again we can just borrow some code from register so inside my register method we are going to have this dot submitted is true and then we can have if the login form is valid so i copy and paste then we can say login form is valid then go ahead and hit register so we need to just rename it to login from account service and we don't have that login inside our account service so we need to create that so i open my account that service then just above here we have login and this takes a model of login and we need to create the interface as well so i going to create my interface inside shared and models then i hit right click and hit new file and i name it as login.ts then inside here we have export interface login and this has username of string so i make a capital of n and then we have password of string then i head back to account.service and i can bring that interface and this time we have return this.http.post and we use backtick so i borrow this code and i put it over here and instead of uh, register we are going to hit the login endpoint and we pass the model and i head back to my login.component.ts then we should pass the login form and for the next we are going to handle that in the next section but for the errors we are going to have the same code as register now we need to uh, bind our form into login form so the way we do we open login.component.html then inside here we have form group and we name it as login form and we have ng submit is login so we are going to hit login method after the form is submitted and auto complete as off and then i open my register to borrow some code so for the first one is form control name i copy this and inside my input for the email i'm going to paste it over here and the form control name is username and this is going to take the username of the user account and this is going to take the username of the user so inside the placeholder we can say username and and for the or this is username and we can have the same message so i copy this 
And then I can borrow another code from register component, which is class is invalid. So if I copy this, if I go back here, then uh, I can paste it over here. And instead of register form, we have login form. And for the get, we have username. And for the span of text danger, so uh, we can borrow this code. I copy this, then in my login form, I'm going to paste it after the label. And we are going to check if the form is submitted and is the login form, uh, the get of username has error of required. And if so, then we can say username is required. And we can do the same for the password. So I copy this, I paste it over here. And for the form control, name we have to do for the password as well the modification and we are binding the this into our password property inside login form and for the span we have uh, the required as well so i copy this and text danger if the form is submitted and login form and password has the error of required and say password is required and once again, I head back to register component and for the validation that we received from the API, I copy this form floating in GIF error messages. And then and after the last form floating, I'm going to paste it over here just above my login button. I believe this should be sufficient. So if I save everything, I open my login form. So I'm, I try to log in with a bad username and password. So I execute. So for example, I'm going to copy this and for error and for the username, I paste it over here and this is a bad username or password. And this is the error message that we received from the API, invalid username or password. If I uh, remove, then I can see the client side validation. And if I comment out this uh, if a statement in order to be able to see the API Side validation and I'm going to save and I submit my form without anything so these are the validation that we receive from the API side so over here we can see username field is required because this is the default message that uh, API controller is going to place so we can make a modification if I open my visual studio and inside my login DPO then we can have parentheses and error message then we can say username Name is required. If I save start my API application, then if I try to log in once again, you can see username is required. So that was the end of this section, and and in the next section we are going to handle the login functionality and storing and persisting the login to our local storage. So I commit my changes. So I stop my API application and inside Git changes. I'm going to type 03 comma client project setup with registration. I commit all my changes and I push to GitHub. In this video, we are going to handle persisting the user and storing the user detail inside the user's browser local storage. So I open my Visual Studio and inside my account service, I'm going to have a private helper method. So I type private the user. And this set user is taking user model of type user. So we need to create user.ts. So I open my shared and models inside my models. I'm going to create a new file and I name it as user.ts. And this user.ts is going to have exactly the same properties as we have inside user dto in our api so we're gonna have first name last name and jwt so i type export interface user and then we have first name last name and jwt then i move back to my account service and i'm going to import my user model then we are going to have local storage that set item in order to store our user inside local storage and this set item is taking a key and value for the key we are going to have environment dot user key that's what we created earlier so if i open my environment and this is the user key identity app user and for the value we are going to have json dot stringify and we convert our user into a string by using json.stringify 
and then we need to store this inside our replace subject so just above here i'm going to have a private user source is new replace subject of type user or none and we set the size only with one so only one user can be stored into user source so what is a replace subject replace subject has an internal buffer that will store a specified number of values that it has observed so so you can think of this as an observable and we can subscribe to this and then we are going to have user dollar is this dot user source dot as observable so user dollar contains the user source value and it will contain this as an observable so we can subscribe to user dollar anytime inside this application and we can get the user out of that so that's why we have put dollar sign by convention because we are telling that this is an observable so you can think of that user source is a property but the kind of observable property and we can assign a user inside that or remove the user from that and this property has the index of only one value and this property is an array of replace subject with index of one value which means the size of this user source is only one and that one is either null or user object and user dollar is referring to that user source as an observable so we can get the value of user source by subscribing to user dollar that's why user dollar is public and we don't have private before because we want to access to user source inside our entire application by this user dollar but user source is only visible to account service that's why we have added private before that then i head down to my private helper method then we're going to have this dot user source dot next and we pass the user basically we are storing the user inside our local storage in one place and also inside our angular application inside this dot user source why do we store into local storage because whenever the user is trying to refresh the page that local storage will contain our user object inside the local storage but why do we store it inside our angular because we want to tell if this user has some value then that means the user is logged in so things gets better make sense as we complete this section and inside my login before i return i'm going to use a pipe and map function because i would like to do something with my response before returning to the whatever is calling so i use pipe and then i use map from rxjs and then inside map we are receiving user of type user and then i have an error function and i am going to check if user is not null then this dot set user we pass the user to our private helper method so this is complaining because we need to specify the return type of our api post function so inside here we have return this dot http dot post but we can specify what kind of type we are expecting to receive from this function or basically from this API call. So we can specify by, we can specify inside our angle brackets and we can tell that we are expecting to receive a model of type user and the arrow goes away. So a little more explanation for here. So we are going to return an observable, but before returning the observable we are trying to do something with the value that we receive from the api that's why we have used from pipe and map and then inside my login.component.ts i'm going to console log my response i put back in the if condition for the validated form so we make sure that only validated form that gets passed and I try to reformat then I save everything I'm gonna check my database so I'm going to try to log in with this username so I copied this and I head back to my browser and I open my console log as well
we receive undefined from our console log and why was that the reason was because we didn't return our user from inside this map function so if we try to return the user and since we're not returning at all the phases so i need to return null here so if i try this and i save my account.service and if i try to do one more time i'm going to receive the user because we have returned the user inside our map function and if we don't try to return anything then we're not going to receive that inside whoever is subscribing to that function so in our login.component.cs we are trying to subscribe and inside the response we're expecting to have some response but if we don't return from inside map then we're not going to receive that we will be only accessing to that user object inside this map function that's why we earlier saw undefined so we try to use from pipe and map anytime that we want to do something before returning to the whoever is subscribing to so in our case we're not interested to return our user or return not we are only interested to be subscribed so that's why we're not using that because we don't want to do anything inside our next object inside our login.component.ts we want to do our actions inside only this function inside our account.service so that's why i just removed those return values and after this we can access user object inside our nav bar and we can determine if the user has logged in or not so the goal of this section is to display create account and login if the user has not logged in and remove play if the user has not logged in but display play and log out whenever the user is logged in so i open my navbar.component.ts First of all, I need to inject our account service. So I'm going to have constructor public account service of type account service. And then we can access to that uh, user dollar inside our navbar.component.html. And we, are, we can subscribe to that inside here directly. But before trying to show these steps, I would like to show you how to subscribe to user dollar. So at this stage, we know that we have the user dollar, especially when we are setting the this dot set user. So I'm going to go to this definition and over here, after we have set the user source, so we can subscribe to user dollar. And the way we do is this dot user dollar dot subscribe and then we are going to have the next value and response and i'm going to console the like the response in order to show you how to subscribe to user dollar so if i try this and i save everything and i'm going to remove this console log from my login.component.ts as well because i don't want to mix this with another console log that we already have so we have commented out this console log and inside account service we have added this uh, this dot user dollar inside our set user and if i try to log in then this is the response that we receive from this console log so this is how we can access to this dot user source by subscribing to user dollar and we're trying to do the same inside our navbar.component.html and we try to achieve the same thing inside our navbar.component.html how do we do that first of all we need to inject the account service as a public and then inside our navbar.component we want to hide the create account and login button if the user has logged in so i'm going to make a use of ng if and then inside parentheses i'm going to have account service dot user dollar and i use pipe and i use async 
and then if this is not then try to display this ul tag for me so as soon as i save let's see what happens so at the first time we don't have the user object so i'm going to uh, remove my console log i'm going to log in one more time and as soon as i log in then we're going to have a user object then we are going to have that user inside our user source. So that login button has gone because we are trying to check if the user dollar is null. If it is null, then display this URL tag for me. But since we have logged in and we have populated that user source by this line of code, and we're trying to subscribe to user dollar, uh, the same way that we have done over here for the demo we're trying to subscribe to that and we're trying to retrieve the value from that so it's going to have some values that's why this is not become null and if this is not null then it doesn't show this based on this if condition so i try to demo this how, do, how we can achieve our user by subscribing to user dollar and this line of code for subscribing to the user dollar is exactly done by this line of code inside our navbar.component.html. So inside our HTML, we use from this, but inside any TS file, we use from this type of code. So I'm going to remove this from my set user because we are not using that and it was for demo purpose. And then I head back to navbar.component.html and then I'm going to add another div tag. So just below my URL, I'm going to have div dot. And then inside here, we are going to check if the user dollar has some value. So the way we do, I copy this and I paste it down here. And instead of equals to null, we try to check if the user dollar has some value by this type of if condition. And then we can retrieve the response type by storing into a custom variable. The way we do by typing as user. And then we're going to have a tag dot. And then I'm going to remove the href and instead we are going to use a style. And then I have text decoration as none and cursor pointer and inside my a tag i'm going to have a height and i have a span of class h3 text warning and i'm going to have user dot first name and i'm going to use a pipe as title case so if i try to reformat and i'm going to bring this down and underneath of this we are going to have another a of class btn btn secondary and ms2 to have a margin start of two and then we have a click and log out and we name it as log out so just underneath of ul we have another div and in this div we are trying to do exactly the opposite of this one so if the user has logged in we try to display these two a tags and one of them is I the first name whoever the first name is and then we are going to have another button for the logout so whenever the user would like to log out from the application and we have to create this method inside our navbar.component.ts so i'm going to create that over here so the error has gone and let's try our application so i save everything and i try to log in this time I'm going to log in with something that has some proper name. So I, I try to log in with JSmith. I copy this into my clipboard and then I paste it over here and I try to put the correct password. And as soon as I log in, I can see hi John and log out. But if I refresh my page, then we have lost our user. So we're going to deal with a refreshing page in the next video. In this video, I'm going to solve the issue that we are having at the moment whenever we refresh the page. So for now, we have saved the 
user object inside local storage so if i try to open my local storage from the browser so i navigate to storage and inside local storage inside this i have identity app user and this is exactly the key that we have specified inside our environment.ts identity app user and this has a string of value so whenever the user is trying to refresh the page the local storage remains the same so we can access to this local storage inside our angular application and if this local storage does exist then we can populate our user source based on whatever we are receiving or retrieving from the local storage so first of all we need to get a jwt from the local storage so just above set user we're going to have get jwt and inside here we have const key and is local storage dot get item environment dot user key so based on this key if key is not null then we have const user of type user is json dot parse key so we are trying to convert the string of values into an object of type user and store it into user then we can return user dot jwt and for the else we can return not so over here we try to stringify the user but over here we try to do the opposite from the string we try to get the object so that's exactly the reverse of this functionality and whenever the angular application gets started the only the very first thing that you can think of as a main function if you're familiar with other programming languages so is the inside app.component.ts and over here we try to do implements on any and i fix the issue by implementing the interface and over my ng on init i try to call this dot refresh user and we need to create this function just below here so we have a private refresh user and then we're going to get the jwt so i say const jwt from this dot account service so i need to bring my account service so just above here i am going to have a constructor and inject my account service so i said private account service of type account service and i put the curly braces and then i say this dot account service dot get jwt and if jwt is not null then try to call another function from account service and I need to go back to my account service and I create that function. So just above my login, I'm going to have a refresh user. And this is expecting a JWT as a string or null. And over here, we check if JWT is null. Then just empty out the user source. So we say this dot user source dot next null. So basically we're setting null into the only element that is available into user source and then return an observable of so we need to bring up from rxjs so i click that undefined if the jwt is not null then try to do the following so we say let headers is new http headers so we need to bring http headers from at angular common http and then we say headers is headers that set authorization comma bearer and we need to provide a space plus jwt and then we say return this dot http dot get and we expect to receive user as a return type that's what we provided inside angle bracket and then we try to call our api endpoint and we try to use from patty then dollar sun environment dot api url forward slash api account refresh user token 
and that's exactly the same as we have specified over here so inside my api project account controller and we have one endpoint and that is authorized and that the name is refresh user token and since it is authorized it is expecting to receive a jwt token that's why we have provided the jwt inside authorization header with bearer and with very important space so if we don't put this space then this doesn't work and then after here we have the headers and we are going to make a use of pipe and map function once again and then inside another parenthesis we have user response of type user and we have a callback function if user then this.set user and we pass the user so this refresh user is trying to call the api endpoint of refresh user token and it tries to pass the JWT inside the authorization header and from the response value which is the user of type user then it tries to set the user that's exactly the same thing as we did for log so we used from pipe and map and we have called this.set user and this.set user is trying to set the user into the local storage and also populate the user source so with all this then i head back to app.component.ts and if we have the jwt then we say this dot account service dot refresh user and we pass the jwt and we try to subscribe and then for the next since we're not returning anything so i put underscore and then we have just empty curly brace but for the error if we have receive some error from the api then i'm going to call another method inside account service which is logout so this is going to be this dot account service dot logout and we don't have that method at the moment so i copy logout into my clipboard and then inside account service just below login we have another function called logout and then inside logout we have local storage dot remove item environment dot user key and then we are trying to set the user source to null so we say this dot user source dot next null and then we have this dot router and we need to bring the router inside our constructor so i'm going to have private router type router and just inside my logout we are going to have this dot router dot navigate by url and navigate the user to the home page or the default page basically and then if i head back to my app.component then the error has gone and i'm going to remove this title inside my app.component because we are not using that and just to finish up this video then inside else we have this dot account service dot refresh user and we pass now to the refresh user method inside account service and we try to subscribe then i open navbar.component.ts and inside my logout i'm going to call this.accountservice.logout and then i save everything and i try to try my application so i open my browser and i log in with a proper user then i can see hi john over here and as soon as I refresh, then hi John will persist. Because we have tried to retrieve the JWT from local storage and then try to call the refresh user endpoint over here. And this endpoint is going to call API account refresh user token and it pass the headers with the authorization bearer to our api endpoint and over here we are trying to return a user dto from here as well which contains a new jwt and after that we are trying to set the user one more time the same as we have tried inside login so that's how we have persisted the user even though the user is trying to refresh the browser and if i click on logout then 
I'm going to remove my local storage and as well as I empty out my user source over my account service. So I'm going to set null into user source and that user dollar will not contain anything and will contain null. So inside my nav bar, then this condition won't work because the user dollar is null by this type. And then we are going to see create account and login. So I'm going to log in one more time and this time I would like to navigate the user back to the home page if they have logged in. So right now it stays in, inside the login component but I would like to navigate back to the home component. So the way I do I open my login.component.ts and inside here instead of this comment I'm going to have this dot router dot navigate by URL and I pass to the home component and also I would like to not show the login page if the user has already logged in so the way I do inside my constructor I press enter and inside here I'm going to have this dot account service dot user dollar dot pipe and take so I bring take from rxjs and I'm taking the first element which is only available inside our user source and then I try to subscribe then I put curry brace and inside next I'm going to have my user of type user so I need to bring user model and the user is either of type user or not and then I'm going to have an arrow function and a curly brace and then I say if user so if the user is not null then this dot router dot navigate by URL to the home page as well. So I'm going to save everything and let's see. So my user has already logged in, so I cannot navigate to login. So even though if I try to navigate to login page, it redirects me back to the home page. And if I try to log out, then I can now see login page over here. In this video, I'm going to create another controller and the name of the controller is play and that is only available for only authorized users. So I stop my API application and I create a new controller and I select API and I select empty and then I name it as play. And just above here, I'm going to set authorized. So only authorized user is available to access this controller. Then I'm going to have an endpoint HTTP GET of GET players. And we have public I action result and players. And then we are returning OK, new JSON result, new message is only authorized. Users can view players so i need to remove object so we, we don't have that so we have only return okay new json result and the message is only authorized user can view players and this controller is for testing purpose in order to call this controller with our jwt token then i restart my api application and then i open my visual studio code and then I'm going to create another service inside my play component. So I open my terminal tab and I navigate to my play. Then I'm going to have a service called play and I skip test and I open my play.service. Then I'm going to inject private HTTP of pipe HTTP client. Then I'm going to have the following method get players. And inside here we return this .http.get and then I use tactic and then dollar curry brace environment. So I bring from environment.development, then dot app URL, then I'm going to have forward slash API play forward slash get players. And I put a semicolon. And then I open my play.component.ts inside here. I'm going to implement on init and I fix the error by implementing interface. Then I'm going to inject my play service inside constructor. So I have constructor and inside here I am going to have private play service of type play service. 
and inside ng on init i'm going to have this dot play service dot get players then dot subscribe and i'm going to have next inside next we have a response of type any then i'm going to have this dot message is response dot value dot message and i put a comma and for the error i have error and i just console log the error so i need to create a message so just above here i'm going to have message of type string or undefined and then inside my play component dot html i'm going to have a p tag and then i'm going to have ng if so i put asterisk ng if message if the message is not empty then just display the message and if i try to save then i head back to my browser and i try to log in once again so i open my console log and if i click on play then i'm going to have unauthorized because we're not passing our jwt along with our headers so we need to pass our jwt along with our headers so if i open my postman and just inside the identity app i'm going to have another folder and i name it as play and inside play i'm going to have a request get players and inside the url i'm going to have url forward slash api forward slash play get players so if i send then i see unauthorized because we need to pass the token along with our authorization bearer so the way we do we need to log in with one of the proper user and when i log in then i'm going to save my token inside jwt so inside my get players inside authorization if i select bearer token and then i need to provide my jwt and if i save and this time if i send then i can see only authorized user can view players so i fix this typo from here so i'm going to replicate this scenario inside our angular i open my visual studio code and inside my shared folder i'm going to have a folder called guards so I click new folder and I name it as guard and then I navigate to my guards so I go back and I go to share and I go to guards and then I'm going to create a guard ps5 so I say ngg guard and I name it as authorization and I skip test and from here I have can activate and I press enter so this has created my authorization guard inside my guards folder so i open that and inside here we no longer need to implement can activate so i can remove this and then i'm going to have a constructor and inside my constructor i'm going to inject my account service of type account service and as well as i'm going to inject shared service for displaying a notification and then i'm going to inject router of type router then i open and close the curly brace and from here we are going to return a observer of boolean so we don't need this url tree i remove this and then we can remove all this as well so we are only returning observer of boolean and inside my return i'm going to have this dot account service dot user dollar dot pipe to access to the user dollar and we use from map as well so i need to bring map from rxjs and then inside map we have user of type user or null and then we have if user is not null then return true otherwise else return false so in order to get rid of the error message just before returning false, we have this dot shared service dot show notification and if success is false this time, then we say restricted area and for the message we say leave immediately. 
and then we have this dot router dot navigate and then inside the bracket we have account forward slash login and so we try to navigate the user to login page and then we have query params column and return url state dot url and we put a same card in order to return the url to the login page and then i open my app routing module and for the play we are going to use from can activate if the authorization card has been passed so i'm going to comment this out and instead we are going to have curly brace and then path is nothing then we have run guards resolver and this is always and then we have can activate and inside bracket we have authorization guard the authorization guard that we just created and then we have comma children and inside children we have i put curry brace path and play and then component is play component and i put a comma over here so basically we're trying to make only authorized user be able to click on a component so if i save everything and if i open my browser right now we can click on play but as soon as i log out and if i click play i can see restricted area leave immediately so that means we have not passed our guards and the guards is checking if the user has been populated if the user is populated then we can click then and we return true and if it returns true then we will be able to see the play component otherwise we are being navigated to account login and we are going to receive the return url as well so in order to finish this tutorial i'm going to navigate to login.component.ts then i'm going to have else then i'm going to access to the return url that we have been passed over authorization card so in order to do that i'm going to inject activated route so i put comma and then i say private activated route of type activated route and then inside else i'm going to have this dot activated route dot query params map dot subscribe then we have next and inside next we have params and the params is of type any then we have if params is not null then this dot return url is params dot get dot inside single quote return url and i put semicolon and i need to create return url of type string so just above here i have return url of type string and return url is of type string or not and i set it as not then inside my login i'm going to check if this dot return url has some value then navigate the user to the return url so i say this dot router dot navigate by url and navigate to the return url otherwise so i say else navigate to the home page so if the return url is not null and has been passed by the authorization then navigate the user to the return url so if i try to save everything and i open my browser so i refresh my client app so i click on home page and this time i click on play component but this is says a uh, restricted area and this is is containing my return url so if i click ok and if i try to log in then i will be navigated to the play component because of that return url but we still see the author unauthorization error message because we haven't dealt with passing the jwt along with our headers so we're going to do that in the next tutorial so in order to pass the jwt we need to create an interceptor so i'm going to create a folder inside my share and i name it as interceptors and then I navigate to my interceptors and then I'm going to create an interceptor by using ngg interceptor 
and I name it as JWT and I skip test. This has created a JWT interceptor and I open that and inside my constructor, I'm going to inject account service. So I say private account service of type account service and just above return next.handle. So I'm going to have this dot account service dot user dollar dot pipe. And then we take the first one, first element and we need to bring take from RxJS and then we need to subscribe and inside next. We are going to have a user and inside here we say if user is not null then then we try to clone from the coming request and add authorization header to that then we have request equals request dot clone and inside curve brace we have set headers then inside headers we have authorization and colon then we have backtick bearer space dollar sign curve brace user dot jwt and i put the required semicolons so basically we are trying to inject bearer inside our authorization inside the headers along with every api request that we are trying to do if we have user populated so basically if the user is logged in so we try to add this bearer plus the jwt inside the authorization headers then i open my app.module and inside providers i'm going to have a new line and then carry brace provide and http underscore interceptors comma use class and the class is jwt interceptor and we have multi true so with this provider we are trying to make a use of our interceptor and for each api request if we have the user populated or the user has been logged in then we will try to add the jwt inside our authorization header so i'm going to save everything and then i try to hit my play then at this time i can see only authorized users can view these players because we have set the jwt inside their headers so if i open the network and inside my get players if i open this and inside my request and inside headers if i scroll down i can see authorization bearer and the token has been applied to my api card so if i navigate to my home and if i come back to play then another request has been triggered and this api call is containing my authorization bearer and we can hit the player controller and get players endpoint over here because we are authorized open the register.component.ts and inside my constructor i'm going to have this dot account service dot user dollar dot pipe and then we take the first element and then we subscribe and inside the subscription inside next we have we have user of type user or null and we need to bring user and then we are going to have if user is not null then this dot router dot navigate by url and navigate to the home page so if I save and if I try to access to my register component, then I will be navigated back to home component. And in this section, we have completed the user persistence. So I'm going to push my changes into GitHub. So I open my Visual Studio. So I stop the application and inside my Git changes, I'm going to say, I type section 04 user persistent in Angular and I commit my changes and I push to GitHub. In this section, we are going to implement email confirmation and email send setup. And we are going to set up our email send using MailJet. First of all, we need to create an account there. So I navigate to MailJet.com and I click on Get Started. Then type your email address and password and click on Sign Up. And we are going to choose a free plan. And then we fill up the forms and we click on next and complete order then you need to 
come back to your email and confirm your email address and activate your account. Then once your email is activated, you can click on drop down and click on account settings. And from the account settings, click on API key management from REST API. And from here, generate a secret key. And you need to copy this API key and secret key somewhere. So I copy them in, into my Notepad++ and then open your Visual Studio and open app settings.json. And after here, put a comma and then we have mainjet. Then copy and paste your API key and secret key there. These are sensitive information, so make sure not to push them into GitHub, or if you are pushing to the GitHub, then you need to destroy those. Or you can use from user secrets and have your mailjet API key and secret key in your secret key. The way you can do is by right clicking in on API and click on manage user secrets. Then in this case, you are not pushing your secrets into GitHub. And I'm going to destroy my secret key once I finish this section. And the way you can do is by clicking on the Cognito icon, and then you can click on Reset Key. And you can type Reset and reset your secret key. So it depends on you, whatever you're trying to do, but uh, make sure not to send your secret key into your GitHub, or at least destroy the secret key that you have pushed to the GitHub. Otherwise, any other user can use from your secret. And then just above Mailjet, we are going to have another section called email. And from, from is the same email address that you have signed up for your Mailjet. So I have used from identity app 546 at gmail.com. Then application name. And I name it as identity app. Then confirmation email path. And then we have reset password. And these two are going to be used inside Angular. But since we are here, we are going to type here or anyway. And we need to put a comma over here. So you need two sections. One is the email and one is the mail gen. And the mail gen has API and secret key and your email has from application name and confirmation email path and reset path. And this is confirm email path. So make sure this is confirm email path. And after that, you need to install mail jet nuget package in your API project. So right click on API and manage nuget packages. Then search for mail jet and choose mailjet.api version 3. So I'm going to choose mailjet.api and the latest version is version 3. Then I'm going to save everything and I close NuGet package and as well as app settings. Then open the services folder and create another class and we name it as email service. And inside your email service, we have a constructor, and inside the constructor, we are injecting our configuration in order to get access to the app settings. Then I initialize my config, and we are going to have the following method. And we have public async task of type boolean send email async. And this is receiving an email sent DTO as a model. And we need to create email send DTO. So inside my DTOs folder, inside my account, I'm going to have another class and I name it as email send DTO. And inside here, we have property of string two and property of string subject and another property of string body and i put my cursor in image send dto and i control dot and then i select generate constructor dot 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 then i select okay 
So in this case, we are going to have a constructor to initialize our properties. Then I navigate back to my email service.cs. And inside here, we are going to have mail jet client. So we need to bring mail jet client. And this has coming from mail jet client. And then we name it as client is new mail jet client. And we need to give the API key and secret key. So we have config and inside bracket, we have mail jet colon API key. And we put a comma, then we have config and mail jet colon secret key. So make sure you don't have any spelling mistake here. So otherwise it doesn't work. So you need to make sure that the spelling is exactly the same as you have a specified over here. So mailjet API key and mailjet secret key. Then I need to bring my email send DTO. And after here, we are going to have var email is new transactional email builder. And we have dot read from new send contact and we have config email from so that's the from email address that you have specified over here email from and this is going to be the same email address that you have created your mail jet account and we put comma then we have config email application name then we have dot with subject and we have email send dot subject so the subject that we receive from our model then we have with html part email send dot body and then we have with two new send contact and then email send dot two then we have build and we put a semicolon then we have var response is await client dot send transaction email async and we pass the email. Then we have if response dot messages is not null. Then we have if response dot messages and in the index zero dot status is calls to success. Then return true. Otherwise, we return false. Then you need to open program.cs and provide your image service as a service over here. So just below JWT service, we are going to have another builder.services.adscope and we provide image service. And then I open my account controller.cs and inside here, I'm going to inject my email service and as well as i configuration so i have email service and i name it as email service and then i initialize the field and i'm going to have i configuration and i name it as config and i initialize this as well then i head down to register endpoint and we no longer uh, are manually confirming the email so i remove this line so make sure email confirm is true as removed. And I'm going to comment out my return. Just before my return, I'm going to have a try and catch. And I have an exception here. So I need to bring exception. And for any exception, we have a return bad request. And we have fail. And then inside my try, we have if await send confirm email async and we pass user to add and if this is true then we are going to return a okay so i cut my commented code and then i paste it over here and i remove the comment part and instead of this message we are going to tell your account has been created please confirm your email address so instead of you can log in we say please confirm your email address and we need to create this private method. So I copy this and I head down to my private helper methods. And over here, just below here, we have private async task of type boolean. 
and I paste send confirm email async. And then this method is receiving a user object and we name it as user. And inside here, we are going to create a token using user manager. So we say var token is await user manager dot generate email confirmation token async and we pass a user and then we have token is web encoders dot base url dot base 64 url encode and then inside the parentheses we have encoding so we need to bring encoding from using system dot text dot utf8 dot get bytes and we pass the token and we have var url is we are going to use from string interpolation so we put dollar sign and double quotation and inside here we have a curly brace and we have config and inside my config we have jwt colon client url then after my curly brace we have forward slash then we have another curly brace and we have config and inside bracket we have email colon confirm email path so make sure don't have a spelling mistake or otherwise copy and paste from here so i copy confirm email path and i head back to my account controller and i paste it over here and then after the closing square bracket we have comma and we have token equals then i put another curly brace then we have token and then after here we have and email equals then we have another curly brace user dot email and then we close our string interpolation by putting a semicolon then we have var body is then we use from another string interpolation so we have p tag and we end the p tag right here and just inside our p tag we have hello and then comma and then colon space then we use from carry brace user dot first name and space then another carry brace and user dot last name then we add plus and then we have a string and inside the string we have p tag and we close the p tag and then we have please confirm and then we have a plus and then we enter and in in a new line we have a string interpolation and we have a p tag and we just close the p tag right away because we don't want to make an incorrect html code there is no intelligence in here so make sure do not create any incorrect html tag and after here we have a hrefs and then i close my a tag then we have a plus and inside a new line we have another string and inside the p tag we have thank you and then inside another string interpolation we have a br and then inside a curly brace we have config and inside the bracket we have email colon application name so i go back to my app, app settings.json and i copy application name and i head back to account controller and I paste it over here and then I put a semicolon to close my body so anytime I was using any C sharp code I use from dollar and quotation so that's called string interpolation but anytime that I'm using a simple string so I use from double quotation and this is the email that we are going to send the client so by saying hello first name last name Please confirm your email address by clicking on the following link. And this is a, a tag. And inside the a tag, we have the URL that we have created over here. And the URL is containing the client URL. So if I go back to app settings that development, so we have client URL. This is the client URL. And forward slash, then we have 
uh, email confirm email pass. So my confirm email pass is uh, account and forward slash confirm email. And then if I go back, then we have question mark and token and we pass the token and as well as the email address. So this is going to be the, the URL that we are passing along the email that the client that the user is going to click. And once they click, they will be navigated to the Angular site and they are going to confirm the email from there. And that URL is containing the token and as well as the email address. And after here, we have our email sent. This new email sent DTO. And we are making use of the three argument constructor that we created. So we have user.email. For the two and for subject, we have confirm your email and then, and for the body, we pass the body. Uh, I put a semicolon, then we return await email service dot send email async and we pass the model. So our send confirm email async has been completed. Then I go back to register endpoint. And we have an error message over here. If I hover over here, it says not our code paths returns a value. So that's complaining from here. So I need to copy my bad request and I paste it down here as well. So the error has gone. And I'm going to start my API application and I open Postman. And inside my account, I'm going to register with a user account that I haven't registered inside my application. And this time we are going to put a valid email address that we can access to. So I put, and if I send, then I can see your account has been created. Please confirm your email address. So if I navigate to my, this email address, then I have received an email from identity app and if i click i can see hello john smith please confirm your email address by clicking on the following link and if i click then i have the url of my angular localhost colon 4200 forward slash account confirm email and we have a token and this is the token that we have generated and as well as we have the email address so we're going to handle confirm email next Okay, let's complete confirm email endpoint. So I stop my API application and just below my register, I'm going to have another endpoint and I name it as confirm email. So we have HTTP put and we name it as confirm dash email. And we have public async task of my action result and then confirm email. And this is taking confirm email dto and we name it as model so we need to create confirm email dto so i copy this and inside my dto's account so i'm going to create another class and i name it as confirm email dto and inside this class we have a property of string token and as well as string email and we are going to use from data annotation so we put required on top of both and for the email we are going to use the regular expression so i open register dto and i copy this regular expression and i come back to confirm email dto and i paste it down here and then i navigate back to my account controller and inside my confirm email we are going to have var user is the wait user manager dot find by email async and we pass model dot email so we are going to fetch the user using user manager find by email address and then we are going to check if user is null then return unauthorized and we say and then we are going to check if user dot email confirm is true then we return bad request and we say your email and then we use try and catch block once again 
and inside my tribe we have while decoded token bytes is web encoders dot base 64 url decode and we pass the model dot token and then we have var decoded token is encoding dot utf8 dot get string and we pass decoded token bytes then we have var result is await user manager dot confirm email async and we pass the user and decoded token and we check if result succeeded then we return ok and inside ok we are going to have new json result and if the result is not succeeded so we return a bad request and we say invalid and we copy the bad request and we put it inside our catch also so why are we using try and catch because this confirm email might throw some exception if the token is invalid or the user has provided some invalid token for example the user has remove some of the characters and try to confirm their email using this url so that's why we have put inside try and catch for any exception we say invalid token and you might wonder why we are encoding and decoding the token so inside our send confirm email async we are trying to create a token using the user manager and that user manager is creating a string of token but we are converting our token into base url encode and this base url encode is taking a byte array so we are converting our token into a byte array and converting that byte array into base 64 url encode basically we're trying to encode the token and we try to encode the token on the way back to the client and we try to decode the token on the way back to the api so inside here we try to use from decoded token and we use from base url decode and this is taking a string of input and that one is our model.token and then we have decoded token using encoding.utf8.get a string so this decoded token has been converted to byte array and then from here we are trying to retrieve the token by converting the byte array into a string so basically inside send confirm email async we try encode the token so this token has been encoded and once we receive the encoded token from our model we try to decode the token and then we are making use of user manager from confirm email async and confirm email async is taking the user object and as well as the token and based on the token and the user object and if both of them are valid then the result will be succeeded so this is going to confirm our email inside the user property so for example if i examine my database inside ASP.NET users for example i have created my second user and the email confirm is zero but if this is succeeded then it is going to automatically update my database and for that record is going to confirm our email and email confirm will become one or true and if that is uh, succeeded then we are returning a okay response otherwise we are returning bad requests and we have put both of them into try and catch because this might throw some exception and for any exception we are trying to return something to the client so i start my api application and from the url that we clicked over here so i'm going to copy this into my clipboard the whole thing and i open my postman and inside my account i'm going to create another request and we name it as confirm email and we have the url forward slash api forward slash account forward slash confirm email and the type is put since we have a specified http put over here and i click on body and raw and i select json and inside my json we are going to have 
So if I open and I open my config email DTO, we are going to have a token and email. So we have a token and colon. Then inside my quotation, I paste the whole thing and I put comma and we have email. And I put colon and a quotation. So from this URL, I'm going to cut the email address and I paste it over here. And for the token, so we need to make sure we are only having the token. So the whole HTTP URL all the way to token equals should be removed. And as well as we have to remove the Anderson and email equals. So the my token is going to be this. So make sure to have put a valid token. And I'm going to save uh, my request. And then I'm going to put a breakpoint inside my confirm email. And if I send, then if I hover over, I can see I have my email address and the token. And if I step forward, so I retrieved my user object using user manager. And if I step forward, so it is going to check if the email is confirmed. So in this case, the email address is not confirmed. So it passed this if statement and then it goes to the try and catch. And then we are trying to decode the token. And if I step forward, then I can see my decoded token has been converted into a byte array. And if I step forward one more time, then I can see this is the token that we have generated before inside our send confirm email async. And then this is going to check the user object and the token. So if I step forward, then I can see the result is succeeded. So at this stage, uh, this should become one. So if I execute one more time, I can see email confirm is one. So it has updated my database. And then if I continue, then I can see email confirm. Your email address is confirmed. You can log in now. And if I try to send the request one more time, this time I'm going to step forward. And then I can see the email is confirmed before. And if I continue, then I can see your email was confirmed before. Please log into your account. And I'm going to manually set email confirm to false. So I say update identity app dbo.aspnet user set email confirm to zero where ID is. So I'm going to set the email address to false for this ID address. And then I'm going to remove some of the characters in order to make some a bad requests. And I try to send. So if I step forward, then the succeeded is false because we have passed some bad token. And if I continue, I can see invalid token. But if I put those characters back in, and if I try one more time, so I can see the email confirmed. Okay, let's try to create another endpoint and we name it as recent email confirmation link. For example, if the user has not received the confirmed email and they try to resend the email confirmation link. So we provide that feature for the user. So I stop my API application and we are going to have HTTP post and we name it as recent dash email dash confirmation information link and we are going to receive an email from url so i have forward slash email and then we are going to have public async task by action result and then we have resend email confirmation link and we are receiving a string of email from the url so inside my endpoint we have more user await user manager dot find by email async and we pass the email and before this we are going to check if the string is null or empty and we pass the email then return bad request and we say invalid email then after my bar we are going to check another if the user is null then return unauthorized and we say this then we are going to check if user.email 
is confirmed is true. Then we return another bad request and we say your. So we do a couple of checks if the email is empty and if we're not retrieving the user or the email address is confirmed before. But if all of the checks has been passed, then we are going to have a try and catch block once again. And inside my try, we are going to have if await send confirm email async and we pass the user. So we are making use of our private helper method once again. So that's why I have created inside a private helper method. And then if that is true or this returns true, then we are returning an OK response. So inside my register, I'm going to copy this and i paste it down here so inside my title i can say confirmation link sent and then i can remove this and i make it as capital please confirm your email address and if that is gone wrong so we return a bad request and we say fail then i copy my bad request again and I paste it for my exception. So I'm going to try this. I start my API application and I open my database and I'm going to select everything and I can see my second account is email address is confirmed. So I try to set the email confirmed to false once again because I don't wanna hit my one of the checkpoints. So I set my email confirmed to false and then I open my postman and I'm going to create another request. So I add a new request and I name it as recent. So this is going to be a post. So I select post and I select URL forward slash API account forward slash. Then I open my Visual Studio and I copy the whole endpoint and inside my postman i paste it over here and i have a forward slash and then i'm going to put my valid email address so my valid email address is going to be this one so i copy my valid email address and then i paste it inside my recent email confirmation and then i try to send then i send then i can see confirmation link sent please confirm your email address and if i open my email address once again and inside my inbox, then I can see confirm your email. Then I can see that I have received another email to confirm my email. So resending confirm email is complete. And if I click on click here, then I can see the same URL with some different token. But we're not going to test this token because we have tested before. Okay, now let's create another endpoint and we name it as forgot username or password. So for example, if the user has forgotten their password or their username. So we are going to handle that situation for the user. So I stop my API application and underneath recent email confirmation, I'm going to have another endpoint. And this time we are using from HTTP post. And we name it as forgot username or password. And we are receiving an email using the URL. And we have public async task by action result. And we name it as forgot username or password. And we are receiving an email. Then once again, I have our user is await user manager dot find by email async and we pass the email address and just above here again we can check this one so i copy my if a string is null or empty and just above my user so we are checking if if the user has not provided the email so we just simply say invalid email address and after here we are checking if user is not then we return unauthorized and we say this email address has not been registered so i can copy the text from here and i paste it over here 
And then we are going to check for the confirm. So I copy this and I paste it down here. And then we are going to make a use of a try and catch because we are going to call email service and that email server might throw some exception. So that's why we are putting in try and catch. And then we say if await send forgot username or password email. And that is going to receive the user. If that's true, then return OK. And we have new JSON result. And we have new. Then for the title, we have and we put a semicolon and for any false so this is returning true or false so if it was false then we are returning a bad request and we say fail this and for exception we try to send the bad request once again so i'm going to create this helper method just inside my private helper method section. So underneath send confirm email async, I'm going to create another private helper method. So I say private async task and it returns a boolean and we paste the name, send forgot username or password. And then this is going to receive a user. And then I copy this three line and I paste it down here. And instead of generate email confirmation token async, I'm going to make a use of generate password reset token. And then we are going to encode the token. And for the URL, we have JWT client URL forward slash config email and confirm email pass should be replaced by. So I open my app settings.json. That should be replaced by reset password path. So I copy this and instead of confirm email path, we have reset password path. And that reset password path is using another endpoint. So it has account forward slash reset password inside our Angular. And then we have the token and as well as email inside our URL. Then I'm going to copy the body and then I paste it down here. Then we have hello first and last name and inside my p tag i'm going to have username colon so i need to make a use of a string interpolation so just before here i put a dollar sign to convert this string into a string interpolation and then we have user dot username so in case they have forgotten their username so we're passing the username and then after here we have another string and inside my string, I have a p tag. And inside my p tag, I have in order. And I put a plus over here. And then we have the click here as well. And we have thank you and application name. Then we have var email send. So I copy these two line and I paste it down here. So var email and and we are going to send another email to the user. So if I navigate top and the error message has gone and I'm going to check this endpoint right now. So I start my API application. So first of all, we are checking if their email has been confirmed. So they have to confirm the email address. So if I examine my database, I can see uh, the email is not confirmed. So I'm going to manually confirm my email in order to pass this uh, checkpoint. So right now I have confirmed my email address. Then I open my Postman and I create another request. So I save uh, my previous request in order to be available here. And then I create another request and I name it as forgot username or password and i say we are expecting to receive an email and then inside my url we have url for a slash api account and i can copy and paste from 
here we forgot username or password and then we are providing the email address so i can copy the email address from here and i paste it down paste it over here and this is going to be http post so i select post and i save into my api collection and then i try to send this request and once i send i can see your email address was confirmed before please log into your account so uh, we have made a mistake so we are checking if the email is confirmed so this has to be false and instead of uh, your this message we can say please confirm your email address email address first so we're not trying to send forgot username or password for any user that they haven't confirmed their email address. So this has to be checked against false. If their email was not confirmed before, then we're not trying to send the email. So I restart my API application and then I try this one more time. So I send my request and then I can see forgot username or password email sent. Please check your email. So if I open my email address, then I can see confirm your email. And if I open, then I can see hello John Smith username. In order to reset your password, click on the following link and we can see the click here. And if I head back to my account controller and inside my send forgot username or password, the subject of the email should be changed to forgot username or password instead of confirm your email so for this email we are sending with another subject so if i restart my api application and if i try this one more time then if i check my email address then i can see uh, i have received from identity app and the subject is forgot username or password and if i open that it says hello john smith username is this one and in order to reset your password, click on the following link. And if I click on the link, then I can see the pass is different from confirming email. So we can see reset password along with the token and all the way with the email address at the end. So we are going to finish this section by completing the reset password endpoint. So I stop my API application and just underneath my forgot username or password, we are going to have another endpoint. And this is going to be HTTP put because we are trying to reset the password. That's why we are using from put. And put means updating. So we try to update the password and we name it as reset password. And then we have public async task by action result. And we name it as reset password. And we are receiving a reset password DTO and we name it as model. So we need to create a reset password DTO. I copy this and inside my account folder, I'm going to create another folder and I name it as reset password DTO. And inside my reset password DTO, I'm going to have token, email, and new password. So I can make use of copy and pasting. So inside my confirm email DTO, I copy these two properties and inside my reset password DTO I'm going to paste those as well and after here we are going to have property of the string new password in case the user has tried to reset their password and this reset password is going to be required as well so we name we put required attribution at the top and then we are going to check the minimum and maximum length of the password so if I open my register DTO then we are going to copy this and inside my reset password DTO after here, we are going to paste it over here. So, so we can say new password must be at least six characters and maximum 15 characters. And then I head back to account controller and we are going to have var user is await user manager find by email async and we pass the model.email and if user is null then return unauthorized and we say this email and we are going to check if user dot email confirmed is false then return a bad request so this has to be 
double records and we say please then we are going to make another try and catch and then inside my try i'm going to borrow some code from confirm email so i copy all this line of codes and then inside my reset password i'm going to paste those over here and then we are going to decode the token and for the result we are going to make a use of reset password async so we try to make a use of another function from user manager and that is reset password async and this is expecting to receive a user object token and as well as new password so we have provided user and token and then we can say model dot new password and if the result is succeeded then inside title we can say password reset success and inside the message we can say your password has been reset and for the bad request we can say invalid token please try again so i copy this and for any exception i have the same message then i'm going to try this endpoint so i start my api application and i open my postman and then i'm going to create another request and this time we name it as a reset password and this is going to be http put so I select that and we provide the URL and forward slash API account forward slash reset dash password. And inside body, we select raw and JSON. Then we have a token and we have email and we have new password. Then I open my browser and when I click here, we can see localhost 4000 account reset password. So I copy the whole thing into my clipboard and I paste it inside my token. Then we cut the email part and we paste it inside the email section. And then we are going to just provide the token. So I remove all this from my URL. So make sure only you provide the valid token. So you need to delete the equal sign as well. And as well as at the end, you need to remove the ampersand and email equals. So everything should be removed. And this is a valid token. And for the reset password, I'm going to reset it to 654321. Then I'm going to add a breakpoint over here. And I try this endpoint. When I send, I can step forward. So my user has been found and the email is true. And then if I step forward, I'm going to decode the token. And inside my result, I'm going to pass my user and token and the new password. And then if I step forward, then the result is succeeded. Then if I continue, I can see password reset success. Your password has been reset. And I'm going to save this request into my postman. Then I try to log in the user with the new password. So I copy the email address inside my login, inside the body. I'm going to paste that over here. And if I try with the old password, then I can see invalid username or password. Then if I put the correct password, then I can see the proper result. So at this stage, we have completed this section and we are going to push to the GitHub. So I stop the API application and inside my Git changes, I'm going to make a following comment. Section 05, email confirmation, comma, reset password email, complete. And I commit all my changes and I push to GitHub. But before pushing to the GitHub, make sure you're not pushing your API key and API secret. So these are sensitive information, but if you are still pushing to the GitHub, uh, you need to reset the secret key. And that's how I showed you earlier. So if you navigate to the mailjet and inside your account, you can click on this icon and click on reset secret key. So I'm going to click here and then I select reset. Once I select the reset, then the old secret key has been destroyed and I have a new secret key. Or you can make a use of user secrets. And if you open your Visual Studio and if you right click on API and you can click on manage user secrets. 
in that case, if you provide your API key and secret key over here, then you are not pushing those into your GitHub. And that was the end of this section.